Skirptards, beware. You are listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Stop it. <laughs> and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, and monsters and serpents, and Skirptards to episode 55 of Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 tangent cube of Stand Back! I'm going to try science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high top the Edwards Plateau. And tonight we are joined, as always, from his secret bunker deep beneath his secret space station and in its secret superposition in outer space. Or wait, is that his secret superposition? Because he often seems to be in more than one place at the same time. Mr. Brett England. How are you doing up, up, uh, down, whatever. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing good, man. Hey, if I'm like <laughs> way down super beneath my secret space station, does that mean I'm on the surface of the planet Earth? <laughs> uh, no one knows where you are. Watcher. All right. <laughs> well, that's good. D- don't. Okay, then it was supposed to be confusing because I don't know where I am. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was like making sure that I wasn't doxing you. <laughs> we don't know if you're out there, up there, or down there. Whatever. You're just, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> doing good, man. Doing good. I, I actually had a thought during the intro that it would be cool if we could go back to episode one, which we can't, so episode two. <laughs> And like see the evolution of the intro because it's like we just keep stacking new cool stuff on top of it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. We, we, maybe Screw when we, you, man. <laughs> what about the second one? <laughs> <laughs> maybe on episode seventy-two we can do a flashback. Right on, like a little of, montage. Uh, episode seventy-two, we can do a flashback of episode t- two. <laughs> 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 But listen, uh, I want to talk at some point. I want to talk to you about that math that you did recently. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. 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 I think that that's going to be awesome. So we'll maybe we'll bring that up in uh, the third, the third segment, possibly. Or the fifth one. Right on. Or possibly the fifth segment. Yeah. <clears throat> that's usually where I end up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <man. laughs> so, Kyle, do you have any news for us? Um... Dang it. I have I have a little bit of news. I don't need to read anything. It, we seem to have been like we've been attacked all over the world by strange NATOs, like tornadoes of different oh, yeah. types. Yeah, like there was a hay NATO that attacked like a bunch of girls in a car, and they squealed when the the hay NATO hit their car. It was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody has thought that the shark NATO is the most terrifying thing that mother nature mother nature has ever thrown at the human race but the eighth fissure in the volcano in hawaii recently made a lava nato due to the updrafts and i watched the video of that and that is now definitely more terrifying than a shark nato so oh shit (laughs) a lava nato sounds uh not not impressed (laughs) (laughs) did it go all like a did it like start traveling around and destroying trailer parks? No. Oh, well then. But it that's was a that's terrifying. Tornado made out of lava. <laughs> <laughs> I think the news article that I looked at called it a volcano nato, but I like lava nato better. Yeah, lava nato is pretty good. Yeah, or magma nato. Volcano nato. <laughs> 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 oh, he, he, the watcher brings up the video right there. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic, right? See, he's impressed. I never saw it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it seems scary. Yeah. So, do you have any news? Uh, not really. Okay. Uh, some guys like dug up a bunch of skulls, full in, of mush, in uh, <laughs> the Aztec skull tower revealed. Oh, you didn't see that one? No, I didn't see that. Um, Aztec skull tower. Yeah. They found a bunch of skulls, called it a, like, and then, like, this trophy rack. See? The trophy oh. rack of skulls. Wow. I don't know. That's about Those it. Those are Aztec skulls, though? Yeah, it says they were Aztec ruins, <clears throat> whatever they were digging through. Thousands of human sacrifices had their still-beating hearts cut out before their heads were severed and added to a monument the size of a basketball court. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> Skulls. 
and they had this this huge rack that they would like run these wooden rods through and they would cut drill holes in the sides of the skulls yeah and run these wooden rods through to mount them all up there hmm so it looks like you know it kind of looks like a, uh, what are those places called where they they store skeletons like uh, like uh, I can't remember what they're called right now um they have them in Europe there where there are so many you know they've been sto- like it's uh, usually cemeteries no <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh <laughs> no it's usually associated with like um it's not catacombs either it's it's associated with like a church usually some kind of uh where where the church has had so many people buried inside of it like wealthy people or uh royals where their where their bodies are actually interred within the building right that they end up have, having too many and they uh, like there's one church there's one where the, everything is built out of like they've got a chandelier out of people's skeletons and wow uh, I, I can't know remember that. what they're called right now yeah yeah this is um, they got a like they made, a, they made a I tower think it's called an os- out of these skulls like they they embedded the skulls into this mortar and oh yeah so yeah I don't know that that was the only thing I saw Here, here's another image of Oh um, yeah, excavating it. Somebody got artsy with the uh, yeah. It's you know, an os- ossuary. So there's an ossuary somewhere in Europe where they where everything has been constructed out of bones of people uh, that are long dead. Wow. The the monks that keep the place like we're running out of room to do anything, so they've built everything out of the bones, like walls, tables, chairs, chandeliers. That would be awesome. Would <laughs> it looks pretty that. weird. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <clears throat> but they're but they're doing it out of respect for the dead, right? Yes, I'm I mean not... the, the dead are long dead, and the and the respect has long been paid them, and like they are constructing this gorgeous, like you know, like a mausoleum, but yeah. everything is beautiful and like candles and everything. It looks about it looks badass, but it's kind of creepy. And maybe it's... that's what the Aztecs were doing. We yeah. don't really know. Like I guess the the idea is that it was horrific murder right. on a massive scale, and right. then they decided to, somebody got artsy fartsy with it. And... <laughs> <laughs> All of these people were killed on top of pyramids. Let's yeah. build a giant thing out of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Everyone so, said it was daft to build a tower out of skulls. <laughs> but I built, built it all the same. same. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> okay. So I kind of want of I kind of want. Oh, it's in Prague. Okay. The Sedlec Ossuary in Prague, and uh, maybe we'll have pictures of it in the show notes. <clears throat> I kind of want to – so a lot of the stuff you were talking about last show with the magnetic field. Yeah. Okay. And the the possibility of what it might do to latent abilities in the human race. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Look at that. See the bones hanging? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's cool looking. Uh, so, again, we were we have this ongoing discussion with Brenner who was on the show on 52? Was 52? I think so. Yeah. And he brought up this – he brought up this experiment that Dean Radin has done, like Dr. Dean Radin, who does all kinds of excellent experiments in telepath, uh, telepathy, just parapsychology in general. And Dean Radin found that people, people's like ability to do various parapsychological things were heightened when there wasn't like a magnetic field, when the magnetic field was dampened or whatever. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I want to know, I would like to know, and I wasn't able to figure this out, I would like to know if he was doing it during the day or during the night, because I wonder if the problem was the magnetic field during the day is being, because remember you were talking about how <clears throat> during a heightened uh, solar, you know, a heightened solar state and a heightened magnetic, like a uh, Terran magnetic field state, yeah. that during the night when the field is cleaner, the, the, you know, things might glow better, or like the, the, yeah. the crystal. So I was wondering if... Yeah, because I was looking at it in terms of resonance. Like, if you have... Uh, like, we were talking about the Schumann resonance. Yeah. So the, the magnetic field itself is resonating. Right. So during the day, it's going to be disturbed by everything going on, you know, coming from the sun or whatever. Yeah. So you might get a, a more, you know, noisy... Yes. Uh, vibration. Right. Whereas and then during the night, it's... It's a cleaner, yeah, yeah. more steady resonant state. So so that's why the nighttime is the right time. <laughs> <laughs> to build pyramids. <laughs> the nighttime is the right time. That's right. Uh, <clears throat> so what I was thinking was all those legends that say things like 
Man Made All was built in a single night by two brothers. Mm-hmm. Kane, in a fit of rage, built Baalbek in a single night. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> 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 so that so you know that experiment made me realize like okay that still fits the legends like <clears throat> he was probably doing the experiments during the day i doubt he was doing them in the middle of the night yeah okay so <clears throat> did he experiment with heightened like uh magnetic fields at different frequency at different resonant frequencies no, I think he just like tried it Damn in a Faraday cage or something That's like that. That's what I'm saying. So so the fact that you get results from dampening it doesn't mean you wouldn't get even better results from increasing it and changing the frequency. Right. And what I was thinking was is like dampening it when it's daytime may actually help. Yeah. Right? Whereas if he was doing it at night, dampening it may not help. Right. In other words, the noise of daytime like may affect people's ability to do stuff. This is this is why uh, like how, why is it there's a, there's this general idea that paranormal shit happens at night. Yeah, that's good. Cuz the magnetic field is just cleaner. Like that's when we can see ghosts. And what are we seeing? It's with our minds mostly. Right? This is why some people don't see Remember the story I told about uh Soraya, the guy from uh Where did the road go podcast? Yeah. The story with the tree and one of his friends didn't totally didn't see it. Okay? Yeah. Like we see these things, paranormal activity, if you're seeing a ghost, if you're seeing, if, if something else is happening or whatever, it's, it's a, like a UFO even, uh, unless it's like what I would consider an incredibly rare actual nuts and bolts ship. You know, you see these glowing lights that move all crazy. I think a lot of it you're seeing with your mind because it's like, and this is the other thing, cameras have a really hard time picking this shit up because it's like you were saying in one of the episodes that like they're not... You know, they're not, we're not seeing them exactly like totally with our eyes. And this camera thing is designed to see what we see with our eyes. Right. So it gets these fuzzy because there's something there. Right. But it doesn't have the ability to see what we're like all the, the, the context that our mind is putting into it. Yeah. And those things happen just generally at nighttime. Yeah, that's true. So I, I wonder <laughs> if like things like, you know, that everybody can do, like knowing you're being stared at or. I mean, because I know, like, I used to go to Starbucks at night all the time, and I knew when I was getting stared at. <laughs> <laughs> but I just thought that was fascinating that it fit the legends, because yeah. the legends always say dwarves built it in the middle of the night, or, or you know, the, the, the elves, the, 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 the good folk, you know, the, the uh, what do they call them? The, the fey uh, folk. The fey, yeah, built it. Uh, in a single night, or Kane built Baalbek in a single night, or Nam made all was built in a single night, or all of the freaking Moai walked to their places in a single night. Yeah. You know, it's always at the night time. Yeah, that's cool. Also, I would say that, you know, in terms of resonant frequencies of the brain, like everybody, you know, you can say, well, the alpha frequency is roughly around 12 hertz or something. But it's going to be different for everybody. You know, it's going to, that's sort of an average. Yeah. So you were just pointing out that somebody, some people can see certain things and other people can't, or some people can, you know, detect this or that. It's just like, you know, I have to sub vocalize when I read and you don't. Right. You know, like you can, you can convert the symbols directly to concepts, whereas I have to convert them to a form of audio. Yeah. Like in my mind. So like, like. I bet you when I'm reading something, my the resonant field around my brain looks different than yours because oh, you're yeah. doing different activities. Yeah. So if we were to say that in order to see this thing, you need a you need to be at a resonant frequency of X, but you and I, when we do similar things with our mind, my frequency is a little bit different than yours. Yeah. So like if you're actually if if certain things that you do with your brain are being aided by the resonant field in the earth, then you might be able to detect when people are staring at you, whereas I might pick up something else, you know? Yeah. I might be able to detect when someone's whispering about me. (laughs) You're like, somebody's talking about me. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I'm saying. So, like, like, maybe 
the idea, like you're saying in, in Dean Radin's experience, experiments, if he was deadening uh, some resonant frequency in electromagnetic field, that certain abilities were heightened. Yeah. But perhaps others were dampened. Yeah. You know, uh, I, but I haven't looked into those, so I don't, I shouldn't really speak about that. But What do you think about the retro causality stuff? Like we've talked about this. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I was going to bring that up. That that was a part of, uh, you know, a section in, in Robert Schock's book, uh, Forgotten Civilization. He was talking about the one of the retro causality experiments was that these these people took a test and it was something about memorizing names of places or something like that. OK. And then after they took the test, the computer generated a random practice session for only half of the test. Okay. And so then they practiced on half of the test and then uh, afterwards they saw the results of the test and, and were, the part that they practiced half of that that's that's the one the thing. part that they practiced after they took the test <laughs> they were better at when they actually took the test. <laughs> that's right. Retro causality folks. <laughs> that is a kick ass experiment. Yeah. Dude. So the reason he did that is because it's been found over and over again that this works like uh uh, people who do remote viewing. And who was, I, I don't remember who did those experiments, but was that Dean Radin? Dean Radin has done a lot of that, yeah. Okay, it might have been him. People who do remote viewing <clears throat> have a much higher incidence of, of or uh, I'm sorry, a much higher percentage of correctness when they are shown the correct answer after they've done the, the viewing. Which doesn't help as that much. That sucks. If you're looking for buried treasure that no one knows where it is. All <laughs> right. That's what that's what out of body is for. <laughs> I've always talked about like I would love to learn to like because if you can if you can induce sleep paralysis, because that's the to me, that's the gateway to out of body, because that's like you wake up and your your whole body is buzzing or you feel like this buzzing, but it's it's almost like a, an electrical shock. It's you translate it as a sound, but it's more like a, zzz, you know, like it's almost like mm-hmm. you're being shocked. And that's a, something like your your energy form, whatever you would call it, your soul, your spirit, your energy form is kind of out of sync with your physical body and you can get out of it. Mm. Right. So so sleep paralysis is the first step. And if you can get out of it and then you're actually you're not lucid dreaming. Now you're in the real world as a spirit form. And then that's when you go find buried treasure and shit. Yeah. Cause you can just, fl- you can go to Jupiter and go, or you can go down under the ground and see that. Caves, that's interesting. The, the, the retro causality experiment <laughs> with remote viewing could suggest that they can't really remote view. They can only see the future a little bit. Right. That's exactly what <laughs> Dean Radin points out is that almost, and he also, I was listening to a, an interview with him and, uh, the guy from rune soup, uh, the, the guy that does chaos magic. Yeah. Um, and they were talking about how almost all magic can be explained with retrocausal, you know, with, mm. with retrocausality, that you're actually, what you're doing is precognating your own future knowledge. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like, he was talking about that. He was like, yeah, that is, a, that is an interesting thing. Like, I, uh, like, a lot of magicians don't like that. They want to be like, no, I'm doing magic spells, right? No, you might just be reading your own mind in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Which is still really cool. Why are you mad? <laughs> but it's not as cool. It's not as cool as just doing a spell. <laughs> uh, but, like, there are other interesting things with the retro causality, like the experiment where they um, they were testing to see if people knew what picture the computer was going to bring up. And that, and that was a purely physical one where no, you don't have control right. over it, right? And uh, so they hook people up to all these physical monitors. It's sort of like a lie detector test, where they, but they can just detect heightened, you yeah. know, like all this, like uh, it's on your skin. So they're detecting heightened heart rate, breathing. Uh, it has to do with conductivity or whatever. And like people were, people would start to get excited. Like the computer would randomly choose from a, from a huge, folder of images right and like maybe 10 percent of those images or maybe even smaller than that i don't know some some small percentage of the images were uh provocative in some way like they were violent bloody or they were pornography whatever and this test showed consistently that people started to get have an excited or like heightened response long before before the computer even chose which image because it would choose it right before showing it so before the computer even knew what it was going to do they would start to show this heightened physical response like about two seconds before the image came up. 
Yeah. And not when it was so like is that a, retro causality or is it is that them right. interacting with the random random, right. random device in the computer? And that's the question. Dean Radin says that since retro causality is seen everywhere in all these different things, that he thinks it's most More likely, likely that, to be yeah. retro causality. Uh, the other one that they did that was really interesting was where um, the computer would put up four images on the screen and then you would choose one that you thought it was going to pick out of those four to show you next, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and males, not, not females, males would start to get excited when they were right, <laughs> before they knew they were right. Yeah. <laughs> about the uh, same deal, about two seconds before they knew. With girls, it didn't, somehow it didn't, they, they didn't do that. They didn't start getting stoked. But like, that might be because they don't get excited when they, when they win. <laughs> as much as guys do. Right. <laughs> guys are like, yes, before they Spike even know. the football. <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting is, again, it was an unconscious physical thing they were measuring, not like a mental, like, yes, I won. Like, they yeah. started to get stoked physically, something you can't control, and it was correct. Like, when they were wrong, it didn't happen. Yeah. Right? So they pick, like, picture one, or, you know, picture one or whatever, and then when they were wrong, it was picture three, they didn't get excited. Yeah. But when they picked, picked picture three and that was about to come up, they'd start getting excited before it came up. Like somehow, and that you could, again, explain that with retro causality, that they were connecting with their future knowledge that they were right before yeah. they actually knew that they were right. <laughs> so what would be cool is... <clears throat> so guys are, are right so, like, little compared to women that they get really freaking excited before yeah, they actually are yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. That's got to be what it is. <laughs> That's got to be what it is. <laughs> Girls are just like, of Women course are, they I'm right. They already know they're right. Yeah. And even when they're wrong, they're right. So it's like they pick the wrong image and they're like, oh, I'll get the it The computer next time. was wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the computer picks the wrong picture. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be really cool is if the, the, the retro causality was, is actually like, like that we have, it, it kind of ties into, uh, uh, Deja vu, right? Deja vu is very similar to yeah. retro causality. Like you're experiencing, like you know that this is happening or that you've seen it before, but maybe it's because you're actually tapping in. You're just reading the future like right before it happens. Yeah. But it'd be interesting if there is a correlation between like the electromagnetic field resonance and the ability to like – see the future in terms of I don't how do you say retro causality in that context like the ability to have <laughs> retro causability <laughs> anyway it's so precognition you know of future knowledge okay precognition yeah so I was just imagining like a How do you where have future retro causal backward way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm thinking about this idea that we actually have the ability to be conscious of a a length of the present as opposed to just a because like yes. we we imagine the present as like a, almost like a single thing happening right constantly but an eternal instant yes yeah constantly but instant so what if there was what if, what if we could broaden the present in, in into you know five minutes or or a day? Wow, that would be so. The whole day, hard. a whole twenty four hour period is the present. Yeah, so that's what your memory does eventually. It, it, you know, like you could uh, like you'll have a memory of like say you go to Six Flags right and you spend all day at Six Flags and like when you're remembering it as you're driving home. You're remembering it almost exactly w with the same timeline as you had. Like, wow, I, I stood in line forever for this ride, but then, and then I was talking to this guy, and then I finally got on the ride. But then, like months later, when you remember it, the whole thing is a part of your memory all at once. So, like your mind is constantly compressing the memory, and then eventually you can think of that day at Six Flags, and it's all there. Like, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So, so as as we go <clears throat> further into the future, the Past present becomes compressed until you do you do kind of can experience it that way by remembering the whole day all at once. Like, man, we went swimming that day and it was badass. Instead of like remembering every individual thing, they all are just present in the memory. Yeah, I was thinking like I know, but I was just saying like it, that that kind of is like what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. I'm just I was just thinking that what if this also has to do with you know the the electromagnetic field resonance, like like. How, 
I don't know. I'd have to think about what would that enable us to do if the present was actually a, a range of time Yeah, where you could, I don't know. Well, I think that I wonder if that give you a, all kinds of abilities to not make mistakes because you could you could literally like know ahead of time like all you would be able to. It's like our minds already do this when you're say when you're running or something and you're going through like running down a, a rocky you're looking hill. at all the possibilities. Yeah, you're like okay. Yeah, yeah and you're making all these choices like yeah. on the spot and you're making the right choices because yeah. you're not falling. <laughs> right. But if Until you, you <laughs> if you did fall, then if you knew then you're still making choices. Yeah. But if you knew that you fell. Oh, right yeah. before you did, you wouldn't step on that rock. Yeah. So if you could have even five minutes of that, like if everybody could have a five minute present, yeah, then there nobody... would be all kinds of things you would be able to not say, right, not do, and change what you did based on what happens. Yeah. And get everything right. And like, what? Then how that... would you experience it? Yeah. How? What would that experience be like? I know. I, mean, I played a I played a game called um, uh, Life is <laughs> Life is Strange. Where that was basically what it was, the, 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 the main character, the one that you're playing, had the ability to kind of rewind time. Sort of like Braid. Yeah. You could, there was a brief, you had a, a range of time. Like, so you would walk up to somebody and you would say something that was totally the wrong thing you just say. And you would go, and rewind everything. Yeah. And then you could try it again, right? Yeah. Uh, but that's not, I don't think that, that that's not what, what you're talking about. You're talking about having a, like a complete knowledge of, of, of a range of five minutes around where you are in the present. Right. Yeah. So it's like the retro causality. Like you get the, the answers right because you study later. Yeah. So if you could be aware while you're answering the questions of the studying, if you could be more aware of it, right, that you're going to study later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now I'm thinking of your example of like running down the hill. And it, like, let's say that you're like, holy crap, I should be dying right now. Just remember when you get to the bottom of the hill that you need to like really study that hill, walk yeah, up, yeah. Like, like climb up and down it and check everything out. And like, and that way you'll, <laughs> you will have retro causally made sure that you didn't fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Brett brought up base jumping. It's like when you go base jumping and you know, in your little squirrel suit, <laughs> you just got to know when you jump off that cliff that you're actually going to hike all the all way, the way the back up and right, check, and out check every, everything out <laughs> all the trees and everything else <laughs> and then you won't hit anything <laughs> that's right <laughs> didn't they do this in and then you can cheat it because after you get to the bottom you can decide since you have free will that you don't want to do that <laughs> <laughs> but that wait but but if you have the ability to like you're totally going to do this <laughs> right and you can just trick your mind trick the spirit world into thinking that you really are <laughs> somehow i think that would be tempting fate <laughs> you know like you're like you know what i don't want to <laughs> but then maybe that's like what like like what is it like pathological liars you know or the whatever the term is for people that actually believe their own lies oh yeah yeah right so maybe they actually had a skill in the previous world and those were the oh. guys that survived it all this because they could totally lie to themselves. Yeah, they're like, going to do this retro <laughs> shit. Yeah. I'm going to study all this so that I totally survive. <laughs> I totally survive. And then they're like, done. They're like, ah, I don't feel like doing it. Yeah. I never said I was going to study that. Yeah, I didn't say it. I never said that. <laughs> That's why they're still alive today. <laughs> That's why we have so many pathological liars. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So I, they, they did this in Bill and Ted, right? Whenever they're trying to get away from something, they're like, trash can. Remember the trash can? And it would fall over the dude. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yet, but they had to go back and do it. Right. Right. Because <laughs> they're using a time machine. So, like, if they didn't go it's back like, and do the trash the keys. can. Oh, uh, I'll put them in the bushes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. <laughs> Did your dad lose the keys? Yeah. Uh, I put a, oh look I put them right here <laughs> that's right here they are <laughs> yeah so like that, I think that you would if you were f like stumbling down the hill and completely not breaking anything or falling or whatever and you're telling yourself I've got to study this hill and then you got down there and didn't do it you would get yourself into some kind of paradox loop right that's what that's <clears throat> that's the idea of time travel like the reason why they say time travel is impossible. Is because of the grandfather issue. Like you could go back in time and kill or become your own grandfather, and then that puts you in a loop forever. You know, it it basically loops the time around, and then that that's why it is seems to be impossible. Yeah, I am actually not. <clears throat> I'm not really a big time travel proponent or believer. You, I don't really think that you don't think we can go back and see dinosaurs. I think we are time traveling. Let me just put it that way. Yeah, we're going forward all the time. No, I think that I I look at time as more space. It's just another dimension. 
Yeah, Heinlein talked about so that I, too. Like, I think that the, you could take a right turn in the time in the timeline and experience strange, very strange things. I think the key to time travel is spatial. So there's no way to know what our position, what our absolute position is in space, because we don't actually know which direction we're moving ultimately. Yeah. And is space moving with us? Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but the idea is that if, if we could actually go back to the space, the exact space we were in five minutes ago, what if that is where time was five minutes ago? Yeah. Like we're, in other words, like we are three dimensional objects in the space of time and it's all in motion. And so we don't know, we don't even know where we were five minutes ago in space. Yeah. So like, we can't even travel back in space, people. <laughs> Just forget the fourth dimension that you cannot really measure. That's right. And speaking of time, we are out of it for this segment. Look at you, man. So we are going to take a quick break and we will come back and in the future, five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> Snake time. It's eating itself. <laughs> <laughs> Ouroboro time. <laughs> Regulated by the sands of time. A relentless and unstoppable pursuit of pyramids. Pyramids! Two brothers! Snakes in a cube. Snake bros! Concerned with all things the universe. Brothers of the Servant Podcast. Here we go. Dolmans. <laughs> Giant resonant magnets. <laughs> Controlling our retro causal abilities. So... I was just thinking about <clears throat> how far can this retro causality thing go? Because what if I just went and translated all of the ancient Sumerian texts just like right now? Because I know that when I'm like 60 and retired, I'm really going to study the shit out of that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> so I might as well just translate it yeah. now. I was thinking the same thing about the, like we were looking at all the hieroglyphs and like, you know, you were like, well, these are all numbers. I'm like, how do you fucking know that? Well, probably because when you're 60 and retired, you're going to translate them. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dream that I like just started reading them. Like I was able to just, I just started seeing them and know, just totally understanding what they all meant. No, see, now that might be that past life memories. I, I was a sphinx. <laughs> 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 I was an Egyptian slave. <laughs> So I, I was read. a sphinx man, <laughs> and I turned myself into a falcon. <laughs> I was a foul man, <laughs> king. <laughs> <laughs> we shall have <laughs> shit. I can't do it. <laughs> we shall have children. They will be foul king men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But seriously, like if. Uh, Brett, we were talking about it in the break, like these guys that do the base jumping, they, they all have, um, GoPro cameras on their heads. Yeah. And then of course the first thing they do after they're done is go put that video up and watch it. Yeah. So it's like they're studying for the test after they took the test. Right. Because they're seeing all of the trees and everything in their path that they're dodging when they're doing the base jumping. So what if, you know, I mean, they, they record that video and then they, get in the helicopter and then they fly to the wherever get off that and they go put it in their computer and rip the video down and then open it up in the program and then watch it. And right. It could be like eight hours later, 12 hours later and shit. Yeah. And they probably watch it over and over cause they're like, man, this is so fucking cool. Check yeah, this yeah. out guy. Yeah. So uh, how far does it go? Is the point. Like, I don't know. Can, can it be 60 years? You yeah. Know? Like, I don't think there's a limit on. So if I successfully, I mean, tr- dude, if you're reading the future, 
If I successfully translate the Sumerian texts tomorrow, planning to translate them when I'm 60, then I know I'm going to live till I'm 60. So then I can just do whatever I want <laughs> between now and then. And I know I'm not going to glad. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You could. There's all kinds of stuff you could do with this. That's true. I, I mean, like if you take the test and then, well, you can't know the score of the test. See, that's the weird thing. Like if you know the score of the test before you study for it afterwards, then it doesn't work. Yeah. So the guys that do the base jumping, maybe it's not retrocausal effects because they know that they they landed and they didn't die. Yeah. So they know that they passed the test. So studying for it afterwards doesn't matter. Be- but they do anyway. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying that the, the, <laughs> that one of the the key things with the retro causality thing in that one particular test or or experiment was that they couldn't know the answer to the test until after they'd studied for half of it. They couldn't know, I'm sorry, they couldn't know the results of their of the test until after they studied half right. of the test. <clears throat> then they could see the results. But I think okay, I see what you I see what you mean, but I think that um well what are the results like uh, the results of a base jump is like not just did you live or did you die, but like the the actual questions of the the quote unquote test in base jumping is like all of the shit you have to dodge, right? Right. So they know that their score is perfect because they didn't fail to dodge anything, right? But I doubt they think of it like that because it's you know what I mean. So maybe if you don't know it's a test, <laughs> if you don't know that you're having to solve a bunch of questions and answers. Yeah, so it's almost like your conscious mind really just gets in the way Absolutely. of your your time travel abilities. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but maybe that, see, again, could be part of the the resonant magnetic field. Like that that it's it's affecting our conscious minds in a way that, that that's why we're so divided. Like we have yeah. this subconscious and then the conscious. And there's a clear like demarcation between the two, like you can't, you know, unless you're practiced at hypnosis, yeah, you can't really cross over on purpose and do things unless you're terrified, quote unquote, consciously, you know, like, like when you hypnotize yourself, you're really doing things on purpose subconsciously. Right. And uh, the only time it works, uh, uh, like, is like if you're terrified, which is what happens to the base jumpers. Like, I always remember the interview where the guy's like, the first thing that happens to me, I jump off the cliff and then my mind is like, oh, shit, you know, and then he calms down. And like, so it's like a life or death. Yeah. Like suddenly he comes, he goes into like this. It forces zone. you into the, into the right. future. You're, it's like a, this last attempt to, to not die. Uh, so, okay. So also people that experience those types of situations also have other effects like superhuman strength. Yeah. So. That's why I was trying to think of what are the possibilities here? Because, like, can we build ball back in one night if we really have control, like, if, yeah, know, over that situation? Because something happens when you, when, when something in the present just so drastically shocks you out of your normal, mundane, conscious thought that yeah. you suddenly have all these abilities that you normally don't have. Yeah. So, what if, like, if we had more control over that, would we be able to, like, you know, Pick up massive blocks and shave them down real fast. And- yes. Okay. So what I'm thinking of now is liminality. Like, uh, there's this thing that's been becoming more and more clear that paranormal things happen, whether it's strange abilities or poltergeists or ghosts or whatever. Happen uh, UFO. You know, they happen during periods of quote unquote liminality when you're in between, like when you have been knocked out of your groove, right? You've had this groove of like, I get up, I go to work, I come home, I watch TV, I go to bed, I get up, I go to work, like over and over and over. And then like you move, right? Yeah. You move houses and all of a sudden your whole schedule is screwed up and you're in a liminal state. That's what that means. Like yeah. you're in this liminal state in between periods of like being in the groove. And that's when weird stuff happens. Mm-hmm. So I think that's kind of what you're, you're, you're asking, like – like can no- things knock you out of the groove or whatever and like you know what or what is it that happens that that makes these things happen and like so like the 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 superhuman strength happens during a, this like incredible fear like the classic story of the mother or the father picking the car up off of their child yeah, or, yeah. you know it's like 
that's something that jolts you or jars you out of your comfort zone. It's a liminal state. You're suddenly like, holy crap, right? I've got to do something and I have to do it now. And there's no other choice. Like, Yeah. And it's also like, you know, the mind over matter thing. Like, I'm going to flip this car over. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> there's no uh, question uh, of whether it's possible right. or whether you're strong enough. That car is a suburban. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you were just going to do it. And then that's it happens. Right. That's why when you jump off a cliff, you're like, I'm going to dodge everything. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have a squirrel suit. I'm going to dodge everything <laughs> using this squirrel suit. <laughs> Uh, it's like, does the suit really matter, or is it just like you put that on, and so you believe that you can dodge everything on the way down, and so you do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, so what if you have a squirrel suit? <laughs> you should still die. <laughs> and if you jumped off there without that squirrel suit, you would totally not think you were going to live, and you would die. Yeah, that's right. But you jump off there with that squirrel suit, and you're like, I can fly. I am a squirrel. I'm, that's right. I can fly. I'm going to dodge everything and live. <laughs> That squirrels can do this, so can I. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay, so Brett is asking, he says, if retro causality exists, is there such a thing as future casting or antero causality? Which would, by, what do you mean by that? You, you can come on and tell us what you mean by that. Antero causality. No, you can't. Stay away <laughs> from your mic. <laughs> Oh, man, and I, like, just unmuted it and was about to talk and then got the no. <laughs> Keep going. Well, what I'm saying is, like, so you know how in if you read books, like, right, like on these people who are successful people. Oh, yeah. They talk about all the time. They say things like you have to visualize achieving your goal. You have to believe completely in the fact that there will be a positive outcome. Yeah. Like positive thinking, positive direction, all of those things lead to success or positive outcomes. Yeah. So is there also such a thing as like, I, I went with antero causality because it's the opposite of the Latin root retro. I don't know what you would call it. Right. But like in the present, your belief in the outcome somewhere off in the distance fills the gap. So instead of it yes. backfilling, you're sort of forward filling yes. for no reason whatsoever. You have no reason to believe you're going to be successful, but you do. And so you are. That's part of chaos magic. Like, like. On Rune Soup, he talks about this all the time, that like like the purpose of casting a sigil is to is to take your intention for the future and sort of concrete it into your mind as something that will occur. And then that somehow interacts with the way that the universe works and your mind and your intentions, whatever. And it makes that pathway far more likely than if you didn't do that. But that, I mean, whatever, antero causality, whatever you want to call it, that's something that seems to be uh, very common in religious texts. You know, believe. Yeah. Right. You know, faith. You can move right. a mountain. Yeah. And then, yeah, it's like all those self-help books. Like they always tell you, you know, first thing is like, well, you have to think positive. I think I can. I think I can. I yeah. think I can think positive. Have you ever met a pessimist who, like, had all kinds of crazy good stuff happen to them all the time? <laughs> just had crazy good luck and they're just totally pessimist? No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, people who are optimistic are the ones that have, I mean, they'll have bad stuff happen to them. But people who maintain optimism are the ones that reach the top, are the ones that have good things happen to them. You know, uh, like, I learned this the hard way by being a pessimist for a long time about stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> I would always complain that Kyle like would just walk outside of a movie theater and find 20 bucks. I'm like, man, that never happens to me. And it didn't. <laughs> and then I stopped thinking. I was like, well, you know what? It could happen to me. And then I found 20 bucks. <laughs> five, well, it's $5, but still it's, it's, I'm, I'm working my way up. <laughs> you got to start somewhere, man. <laughs> yeah. You've been finding more arrowheads than me lately. So screw off. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me stuck in a funk. Okay, that's actually a really good topic right now. I want to ask you about that enormous... <clears throat> what the hell is that thing for? What enormous thing? The Like the when you were like, oh, and you ran over there and grabbed it. <laughs> like what? That Okay, it's shaped like an arrowhead. It's got the, the tang, and yeah. it's got the long... You know, spearheads were like leaf-shaped. Yeah, that's... Yeah. It's, it's a, way too big for an arrow. Yeah, it's not an arrowhead. Like most of the quote unquote arrowheads that you find are not arrowheads. They're 
they're either a spear point or some an but, at lateral point. But or spear points are like a knife, like round, right? They don't have a, they don't have the twin things coming. Yeah, up. they will. Yeah, they have the the things that come <clears throat> up. Like the there's just all these different types of of. Uh, I was just saying, like bases. it looks like a ballista bolt to me. There's all different types of bases. Like they make these little buck tooth bases. You know, and then there, then where the actual blade started, there'd be like two little sort of wings that come off. I don't know the proper names for all the different parts of the. Okay, of how the, old do you think it is? Because that thing is huge. Um, like, what were they hunting with that gigantic thing? Who was throwing I, it? I don't know. Okay. I would say, you know, late archaic. Or late something, archaic. But I, don't, I don't really know. I'm not real good with that. Because it's too big for. And I actually have another one that's almost exactly like that one. Okay. That is actually on the porch over there. And I, I found when I found that one, I was like, "Dang it!" Because it's just like <laughs> it's just like the bottom two inches, but it's so huge. Yeah. And you're just like, <laughs> man. But it was probably a knife. Like th- there's there's been some whole knives found that are still attached to the bone handles. And they and have they're those, like they have those things coming off the back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they attach them. They attach them into the bone, and then there's like the wing on the top and one on the bottom. Okay, because I looked at that and I was like, "That that's too big for even an atlatl." That's yeah, yeah. That's that's more like a knife. What people would call it, like a knife blade or but something. But it looks like an arrowhead. Why? Because of the way the base is. Yeah. Well, the base. Is, it looks like it's designed for flight, and like unlike a knife, right? It just looks like it's designed for flight, like a like an arrow or a spearhead. But that's. That is generally not how they built spearheads, and it is how they built arrowheads, but I'm like, well, who was shooting that freaking arrow? It's too big for an atlatl. I just thought, like, I, I thought to myself, I was like, that looks like a ballista bolt, like a like a large bolt that you would have in something where you pull back on it and mm. let go. You know what I mean? Like, think a crossbow on the ground, one too big to pick up. Yeah. You know. I don't know why. I I wouldn't look at it and say it was designed for flight. Like, that's, but I don't. Because it has those wings, like. That, that's that's how, those you know. two things that were sticking down are the that's where it was attached as far as I know okay and then it kind of goes out straight on the sides oh okay hmm but there are some huge ones that have like what you're talking about the little wings that come off the side they're like yeah. they're massive and ma- mainly they're not really the wings it's almost like they just cut two grooves <laughs> up into the bottom of the arrow yeah yeah or, or the, of the point like so we make arrowheads like that now, because that inc- that increases their that increases their ability to fly straight and true, right? Um, Whereas a spear point, what you need to focus on, because a spear is. I think it's more about like the damage it would do to the animal. So, like there are practice uh, points for arrows that yeah. don't have wing. It's just a little point. It's mm-hmm. just a sharp point that screws onto the end of the arrow, right? Because you don't want to put razor blades. You know, that's big, wide. Razor blades on the on an arrow because they're just going to get crushed when they go into a bale yeah. of hay or a, a target. So yeah. you put the the just a just a sharp point. Yeah, it's simple. But like, if you want to kill an animal, you want to have those wide blades. Yeah, you're saying they they act like barbs, like they won't let it re- be retracted out or something. Well, they or just make they, a big they cut. make cut they cut more. Yeah, right. They're wider. They cut more. Okay, so. Like a, a lot of the quote unquote bird points that are, you know, that I think are actual arrowheads, they they have these like wide wings that come out. I don't think they're for flight. I think they're for cutting because hmm. they're probably going to, I mean, they're going to break most likely when they, I mean, if you miss or even if you hit one they're that's probably it for that bird point, you know? Yeah. But I don't, I don't know. know. I saw that thing and I was like, it looks like it was designed for, because a spear a thrown spear does not have the initial velocity of an arrow. It just doesn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Uh, even an atlatl is not is not going to have the initial right. acceleration of velocity of an arrow. And so they make the points differently. I thought that the... And, of course, you're going to have fletching, which helps it f- fly straight. Yeah. Right? But you want that... <clears throat> you kind of want this, this, like, aerodynamic thing going on in the arrowhead, too. Along with your fletching, and yeah. I don't know if they they probably didn't rifle their fletching to make it turn. Well, almost every point that I have has a a twist to it. Like even the big ones. Oh, they do have. They did. They rifle they it. yeah. If you look down from the point, like down, like you point the the point of a of an arrow or a, an artifact like right at your eye, you can see that it 
it actually twists a okay, little so bit. Okay, so they did rifle it. But I think that's actually a... Uh, that just happens when you're napping, like the the way that you do it, it ends up it ends up doing that because like I've made them and they all have that same twist and like depending on I think if you're right or left handed they twist a different way. Yeah. So you better get the right Fletcher then because if he if they have his has his fletching turning the wrong way then they're going to be <laughs> fighting each other and it's going to not work. But I'm just thinking like I think the fletching. Can I be wonder. Straight, I, I just wonder if they had like why wouldn't they if you if you understood if you understand the physics of a bow. Who would not think of making a very big bow that was turned sideways, that was mounted on something that you could like put your foot on the stump and then pull way back and yeah. have this giant woof, a ballista? That's what that's called, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, come on, man. No, I mean, I'm, I'm not <laughs> saying they didn't do it. I don't think. I honestly don't think that we know what you know all the things that are quote unquote known about these artifacts. I don't think they're actually known. They're, yeah. they're guesses. Yeah, because. I mean, surely in, in caves and stuff, they've found whole things, right? Yeah. They've, they've found probably some of these points that are well-known points still on a knife Whatever they were on, yeah. You know, that that's, I'm sure that's happened. I mean, there's probably all kinds of museum pieces that are very well-preserved. And I mean, I know there's been arrows and whole, like, quivers full of arrows with the, the heads still on them. And, right. You know, so but I have know Have they found any with that big of a thing on there? <sighs> no, because they didn't. They weren't arrows. shooting arrows. They weren't arrows, right? They were. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I, I don't understand why you would want a knife that had the have those things coming off it because you stick yourself with that. Like it, it's like it's like having a sword that has like spikes coming down back towards your hands. <laughs> yeah, I don't. You know, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if they mounted it to an antler or two, or just how however they carved the handle. I don't know. Never found one, <laughs> but I hope to. I'm. <clears throat> I'm going to find one. <laughs> <laughs> and tarot causality right there, folks. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I'm finding one of those bitches. <laughs> so we'll, we'll put, we can put a picture in the show notes of, of what you found. I, yeah, I'll get the other one because the, the one that I found recently, I left at that ranch oh. on the table. That's right. And it's probably going to be a while before we go back there. I have so many broken pieces. I'm just bragging. Right now, but they're, but I'm not really bragging because they're all broken, <laughs> but I have like, I have like, I have that collection pots full of broken yeah. artifacts. And so when I, you know, find a pretty badass broken artifact on somebody's ranch, I leave it there. Yeah. If it's whole, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> but seriously, if it's a, if it's a really good one, I will ask if I can take it and put it in my table. Yeah. But. Okay, so the next topic, I, I want to go ahead and go through this King's List thing because I've been thinking about this article. Oh, yeah. All right. <clears throat> so this is from Ancient Origins. It is uh, ancient origins, ancient-origins.net. Um, and the, the article is called The Sumerian King, Li- King List Still Puzzles Historians After More Than a Century of Research. So <laughs> <laughs> that's not much research. <laughs> Yeah, most of that century they didn't have the internet. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Out of the many incredible artifacts that have been recovered from sites in Iraq where flourishing Sumerian cities once stood, few have been more intriguing than the Sumerian King List, an ancient manuscript originally recorded in the Sumerian language, listing kings of Sumer, which is ancient southern Iraq, from Sumerian and neighboring dynasties, their supposed reign lengths, and the locations of quote-unquote official kingship. What makes this artifact so unique is the fact that the list blends apparently mythical pre-dynastic rulers with historical rulers who are known to have existed, right? Mm -hmm. The same deal here. Like, well, those ones are mythical, uh, but these, you know, but the list has real people on it. And somehow when you go back in time, they turn mythical because they live too long. The first fragment of this rare and unique text, a 4,000-year-old cuneiform tablet, was found in the early 1900s by uh, German-American scholar Hermann Hilprecht at the site of ancient Nippur and published in 1906. Since his discovery, at least 18 other exemplars of the King's List have been found, most of them dating from the second half of the Isin dynasty, which is, uh, they date at uh, 2017 to 1794 BCE. So 2000 2000 BC. Um, No two of these documents are identical. However, there is enough common material in all versions of the list to make it clear that they are derived from a single ideal account of Sumerian history. And this is the one that they made the, in these, these, like, there were these, um, 
like square columns and they stood on a spindle so you could turn it and read all sides. Yeah, that's awesome. Like sunglasses deal at the gas station. <laughs> I think I've said that once in one of the shows. Okay, among all the examples of the Sumerian king list, the Weld Bundle, uh, Blundell Prism in the Ashmolean Museum Cuneiform Collection in Oxford represents the most extensive version as well as the most complete copy of the king's list. The eight-inch high prism contains four sides with two columns on each side. It is believed that it originally had a wooden spindle going through its center so that it could be rotated and read on all four sides. It lists rulers from the antediluvian, or quote-unquote, before the flood dynasties, to the 14th ruler of the Isin dynasty, which would be uh, circa 1963, or I'm sorry, 1763 to 1753 BC. The list is of immense value because it reflects very old traditions while at the same time providing an important chronological framework relating to the different periods of kingship in Samaria, and even demonstrates remarkable parallel accounts uh, parallels to accounts in Genesis. So, Sumer, some called, sometimes called Sumeria, is the site of the earliest known civilization located in the southernmost part of Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the area that later became Babylonia and is now southern Iraq from around, uh, from around Baghdad to the Persian Gulf. By the 3rd millennium BC, Sumer was the site of at least 12 separate city-states. And here they list them. Kish, Erek, Ur, Sippar, Akshak, Larak, Nippur, Adab, um, Tibira and Larsa. Each of these states comprised a walled city and its surrounding villages and land, and it each worshipped its own deity, or Anunnaki guy, Nepha, mm-hmm. whose temple was the ori- central and original structure of the city. So think about that. The house of God. Right. And kind of like what happened with um, Gobekli Tepe, like archaeologists used to say that the city was founded first and then the temple arrived. But Sumer shows you over and over and over again that the temple was there first. Yeah. Right. Political power originally belonged to the citizens, but as rivalry between the various city-states increased, each adopted the institution of kingship. The Sumerian kings list records that eight kings reigned before a great flood. After the flood, various city-states and their dynasties of kings temporarily gained power over the others. Okay, so here we go. Sumer, Sumer's mythical past. The Sumerian kings list begins with the very origin of kingship, which is seen as a divine institution. Quote, the kingship had descended from heaven, unquote. The rulers in the earliest dynasties are represented as reigning fantastically long periods. They were robots. (laughs) (laughs) They They were just like robots sent down here by the Anunnaki. To rule us. Yeah. And they had bird heads. A kingship came down from heaven, and it was just put in this building. <laughs> or the building that we see now as the temple is like a stone representation of the original ship. Yeah, yeah. After the kingship... Okay, so this is a quote after the, from, a, from a Sumerian translation. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Eridug. In Eridug, Alu, uh, Alulim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Aljar ruled for 36,000 years. Two kings, they ruled for 64,800 years. Unquote. Some of the rulers mentioned in the early list, such as Etana, Lugalbanda, and Gilgamesh. Wait, are wait, myth- wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry to interrupt you. What was the first length of time? 28,800. 28,800. Yes, these 18. are mostly processional. Yeah. <laughs> and then the other one is... 36, 36 9. 9. And the other one... And the other one, when they add them together, 6, 4, 8. Yeah. 18. Yeah. They're all processional numbers. Okay, so uh, some of the rulers mentioned in the early list, such as Etana, Lugalbanda, and Gilgamesh, are mythical or legendary fig- figures whose heroic feats are subjects of a series of Sumerian and Babylonian narrative comp- compositions. The early list names eight kings with a total of two, 241,209. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. 241, two. Right. Nine. Right? Just check check my arithmetic there, buddy. I'm just saying people listening are going to hear you go, 24,209. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The early <laughs> list names eight kings with a total of 241,200 years, when you, when you add up 2412 equals nine. Yeah, there you go. From the time when the kingship, quote, descended from heaven, unquote, to the time when the flood swept over the land and once more, quote, the kingship was lowered from heaven, unquote, after the flood. So... Presumably, the kingship was raised up into heaven during the flood. Yeah. Okay. Interpretation of long reigns. The amazingly long tenure of the early kings has provoked many attempts at interpretation. At one extreme is the complete dismissal of the astronomically large figures as completely artificial. 
and the view that they are unworthy of serious consideration. At the other extreme is the belief that the numbers have a basis in reality and that the early kings were indeed gods who were capable of living much longer than humans. Here at Snake Bros, we fall much farther to the second one than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 3,600, or was this 36,000 years is one of them, but 3,600 is two processional ages. Or no, I'm sorry, it's an age and a half. Yeah. In between the two extremes is the hypothesis that the figures represent relative power, triumph, or importance. I don't think that's in between, but... We'll go with it. For example, in ancient Egypt, the phrase, quote, he died at age 110, unquote, referred to someone who lived life to the full and who offered an important contribution to society. In other words, they didn't actually live to 100. It was a, a, a saying. Yeah. He lived to 110 years old. Meant like that guy did everything he wanted to do and died happy. Right. <laughs> uh, in the same way, the extremely long periods of the reign, but it seems dumb to put that kind of colloquialism in your freaking King's List history. Right. <laughs> In the same way, the extremely long periods of reign of the early kings may represent how incredibly important they were and perceived, uh, incredibly important they were perceived as being in the eyes of the people. This doesn't explain, however, why the periods of tenure later switched to realistic time periods. <clears throat> I'm done. What? It's not a. It's not an age and a half. Thirty six hundred. I'm trying to figure. It's just. It's there though. Yeah, it's processional. Yeah. Three sixty. Three sixty. But yeah, it's not an age and a half. Related to this perspective is the belief that although the early kings are historically unattested, this does not preclude their possible cor correspondence with historical rulers who were later mythicized. Finally, some scholars have sought to explain the figures through a mathematical investigation and interpretation. Relation to Genesis. Brett points out here that the 28,800 plus the 36,000 equals 64,800. So the first two equal the third. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's what they were saying in the article, too. Maybe I didn't read it clearly. They said, I don't know. I was so vocalizing math over here, so I didn't yeah, even know says, what you were saying. Yeah, it says, <laughs> it says, <laughs> hey, don't you be messing with me numbers. <laughs> it says, uh, uh, Alulim became king. He ruled for 28,800 years. Aljar ruled for 3,600 years. These two kings, they ruled for 64,800 years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, 36,000. Yeah. Yeah. Relation to Genesis, some scholars, e.g. Wood, 2003, have drawn attention to the fact that there are remarkable similarities between the Sumerian kings list and accounts in Genesis. For example, Genesis tells the story of, quote, the great flood, unquote, and Noah's efforts to save this, all the species of animals on earth from destruction. Likewise, in the Sumerian kings list, there is discussion of a great deluge, quote, the flood swept over the earth, unquote. The Sumerian king list provides a list of eight kings, some versions have ten, who reigned for long periods of time before the flood, ranging from 18,600 years to 43,200 years. 432000. Yeah. <laughs> this is similar to Genesis 5, where the generations from creation to the flood are recorded. Interestingly, between Adam and Noah, there are eight generations in the Bible, just as there are eight kings between the beginning of kingship and the flood of the Sumerian kings list. Hmm. So in the Bible, they call them the eight patriarchs, right? So you have the eight patriarchs. Biblically, there's the eight kings, the Sumerian kings list. Egypt has, in the, the pyramid texts, lists eight kings pre-flood that lived that live for incredibly long periods of time. It's the same deal. They script over that, too. Even yeah. though they use that same list to, like, say that this is when Khufu was around and he built the pyramid. Yeah. Yeah. Just as soon as it goes before the flood, they're like, oh, that's all mythical, you know? You can't be believing that kind of thing, my boy. <laughs> After the flood, uh, the king's list records kings who ruled for much shorter periods of time. Thus, the Sumerian king's list not only documents a great flood early in man's history, but also reflects the same pattern of decreasing longevity as found in the Bible. Men had extremely long lifespans before the flood and much shorter lifespans following the flood. The Sumerian king's list is truly a perplexing mystery. Why would Sumerians combine mythical rulers with actual historical rulers in a single document? Why are there so many similarities with Genesis? Why were ancient kings described as ruling for thousands of years? These are just some of the questions that still remain unanswered after more than a century of research. And they remain unanswered because people don't want the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's, the that's the end of the article. There's a lot of, there's pages and pages of fantastic comments uh, that we can't really go into at the bottom of that. So if you guys are interested, you should go read the article and then just go through the comments. They are... In a lot of, in a lot of, like April writes good articles, but the comments just really dig into it and they're really yeah. awesome and there's some great ideas in there. So we're going to take a break. We'll come back and we'll discuss what we think about it and give you our comments. <laughs> uh, and we will see you after this short break uh, with our pyramid scheme. 
Are you tired of checking your feed every Wednesday and seeing a new Snake Bros episode? Does your head hurt from 30% brain expansion? And are you tired of having your mind exploded? If you suffer from any of these conditions, don't go to your doctor. Instead, send your money to the Snake Bros Pyramid Scheme. Donate any amount to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast and send those Snake Bros straight to pyramids. I sent Snake Bros two bucks and they went and explored an ancient volcano. Snake Bros Pyramid Scheme. Scientifically proven to increase the probability of Snake Bros getting lost and dying. I gave Snake Bros five dollars on PayPal and they done took off digging in a cave. Snake Bros Pyramid Scheme on PayPal now. Click on the PayPal link at brothersoftheserpent.com. Donate now and send those Snake Bros straight to pyramids. Mind explosions are all of more than gigantic size. <laughs> we are back. Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. First segment of the second hour. And we are flipping over the sands of time. Now, right. speaking of sands of time, retro causality, weird time traveling shit. What do you think about this King's List stuff? Can people, I mean, like, I know the numbers are processional, but. Do you think that that means that the kings actually didn't live that long, that they're trying to tell us something else? I mean, a lot of people think they mean epochs or dynasties, you know? I don't know, man. I I know you don't know. I'm asking for speculation. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm speculating. <laughs> I would speculate that if, you know, if the Anunnaki are real or were real, um, it makes sense to me that, that a being from another planet that had a totally different year, a to- a, like totally different cycles yeah. of nature than ours, like that they would be quote unquote evolved or whatever. They, their life cycles would match their, or even a human with like fully activated space genes, maybe like maybe whatever so. you would call that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, maybe they had, Another thing is that I thought of was like, I, I think I was reading this article actually. How did this happen? I probably tagged it for Snake Bros and couldn't find it in my list because I don't I, I don't delete the ones that I've already used and I need to do that. Yeah. Because I start looking through my like <laughs> my bookmarks right at the end and I'm like, oh, I'm, we're already in the show and I've forgotten to do it. And I'm just like, uh, no, I don't have any news. <laughs> so <I don't> wanna... <laughs> but no, okay. So I read something uh, about... The idea of actually, like, transmitting your mind or your brain, you know, these materialists are thinking, like, they can transmit your whole mind and brain and everything over to another body. Yeah, or into a computer or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, Something like that got me going on this idea that, like, what what if we could uh, actually – oh, I remember – it was it was not that that was what got me thinking about it but it was i think it had to do with the the whole cme you know if if we had these heightened senses of our yeah. true selves our true spirits or minds could we actually would our bodies matter like they do today like could oh, we yeah. actually put our mind into another body yeah possess something basically yeah or like if you have a child can you merge with their mind so well as you're raising them that oh, they are going. they almost like are you? Yeah. You know, they're themselves too, but they also have all of you. Or you rec- like you can record your essence into a crystal skull, for example, and then they can get it back out or whatever. Like I remember there was I, I'm I know that sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> I was just thinking specifically in terms of like this thought made me think of the king's list. Yeah. Like what if they okay, and that, oh, that I see. That basically is like the dynasty, right? You know, it's your your lineage, but if it if it was really like you're the same guy and the bodies are just procreating, they're yeah. doing the the material thing. Yeah. 
I got you. So there's still a question. Is so like, you're just what? inhabiting each new successive body, but you're the same yeah. person. And there, I mean, there's there's still a question about like, what is it when you have a kid? Like, what is that? Yeah. You know, like, is that a whole brand new spirit? Or is it actually another part of you, a part of yeah. your own spirit that's in there? And like, so if, let's say it was a part of the spirit that was inhabiting your body. If you were enlightened or ascended and they became also, then maybe there would be it's some like kind of. It's like there's, like your whole family is a single spiritual being. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter. It's like you, your family is the king. And maybe that's where we got this strange idea of bloodlines. Yeah. In kingship, you know. Mm. And it's like, we're still trying to do this thing where like, yeah, but they're totally not enlightened anymore. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So they, they don't, they all turn out to be like crazy nut jobs and like different people, but (laughs) right. (laughs) That's really interesting. That's a great answer. So that was, that was one of the things I actually thought about before you even brought up this King's list, which is funny. Because Because I didn't know know you were going to bring up this King's list. (laughs) Well, I, I was saying about the comments, like, and I actually wrote one uh, on 2014. Uh, and I didn't know at the time that I was going to be doing a podcast, but here we are. <laughs> and I'm going to read this because this is, this is what I was like, and this is actually in the material sense of longevity. Yeah. Okay. And Brett might be able to, uh, the watcher might be able to, uh, jump in on this after I finish the comment. He can maybe go into it a little bit. Uh, so I, let's, and I haven't read this in a long time. So if it sounds dumb, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, stipulating that such beings truly existed in a, and as described in ancient texts, even if we assume they were purely biological rather than being technologically assisted biological or cybernetic, or just purely technological, or perhaps non-biological but also non-constructed, meaning life based on other elements and or forces than what we are used to, uh, I don't think it can be said that such beings would, quote, defy the logic of time and organic degeneration, unquote. And I was responding there to some, th- something somebody else said, that, pe- that anything living that long defies the logic yeah, of time. Yeah, I definitely don't think right. that. There are plenty of examples within the community of organic life on Earth that display an ability to repa- regenerate or p- repair such that, barring drastic accidents, these life forms are functionally immortal. They aren't literally immortal because the odds of a drastic accident taking place keep rising the longer they live. Um, of course, most such examples of immortal life on Earth are at the very bottom of the, quote, evolutionary ladder, unquote, meaning mostly single-celled simpletons like bacteria – which don't even have the decency to contain their chromosomes within a nucleus like the higher eukaryotic cells do. But they also lack the long repeating chains of nucleotides at the ends of their chromosomes known as the telomeres, which act as a limiting agent in the number of times that eukaryotes can copy themselves. Ergo, these and anything make up, made up of these types of cells, including us, are mortal. The, simple, the simpler plasmid bacterium lacks the limiting telomeres being evolutionarily incapable of even counting from zero to one, and as such is ageless, if not actually immortal, in the purest definition of the word. Uh, Then I give a journal link and say, that link contains the following relevant quote. From the evolutionary viewpoint, therefore, the fundamental nature of cells is immortal, and mortality is an evolutionary phenomenon acquired by eukaryotes. And I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, I think purely from a physics standpoint, functional biological immortality or agelessness is most certainly within the realm of possibility. From an evolutionary standpoint, it is less likely to be an optimal solution because, for one thing, mortality begets evolution through reproduction. Bacteria don't really reproduce. Their system isn't complex enough or controlled enough to do that. Rather, they swap plasmids and mutate. But they can only mutate into another kind of bacteria with different parameters. They do not evolve, not really. They've been mutating all over the place since time began, and they still can't count to one. Aside from, aside from that, the ancient texts and legends and myths of the gods never imply they were immortal in the sense that they could not be killed, nor does it imply that they were ageless like bacteria. They had a generational cycle. It was just way, way longer than that of humans. The immortality of the gods was not forever. It just meant thousands or tens of thousands of years rather than a few decades. A lot of the earliest texts also specify some kind of, quote, divine sustenance, unquote, that was consumed by the gods on a regular basis, something that was fundamental to their longevity, the tree of life, the water of life, the ambrosia of the gods, etc. This was the central driving factor of the Epic of Gilgamesh, which seemed to imply that if one had a god in one's ancestry, then one could possibly attain the immortality of the gods if one could lay hands on the divine food. This appears to imply some type of genetic-related anti-aging therapy, possibly, which is in, was certainly within the bounds of the possible to us today. So that was my comment on just material, yeah, like that's cool longevity. I mean, there's like I've I've seen stories about that too. Like, oh, scientists have just possibly discovered the immortality, yeah. blah blah, whatever. Well, I remember that guy that 
stayed in space for a whole year and got his space genes activated, had longer telomeres when he came back down. <laughs> yeah. Space genes. <laughs> Punch you in the space genes. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna make your space genes float. <laughs> Gonna put divots in the rivets with my physical arm. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. Uh, you got anything to say about that? The eukaryotic cells, Brett? What do you think? No, he doesn't have So oh. <laughs> I've got thoughts on everything. <laughs> of course, watcher. <laughs> so, um, yeah, when it comes to bacterial growth rates, colonies, things like that, they're functionally and for all intents and purposes immortal, but there's actually several you know, quote unquote, basic, um, higher forms of life. For example, lobsters. I don't know if you guys oh, have yeah, heard that's about right. this I ever at any point, but lobsters as adults actually express, um, telomerase, which is, uh, moves along and it actually repairs the telomeres. Ah. Um, and it's interesting that you brought up space genes literally as I was reading this to sort of brush back up on it. Um, in utero, right? Like as an embryo, humans have telomerase. Whoa. It's everywhere because it's basically, you know, writing these long chains of DNA. Well, what happens in Tel- telomerase? In- wait, wait. Telomerase is a an enzyme. What is it? Yeah, it's an enzyme. OK. So in utero, you're essentially floating in zero gravity. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh- I see where you're going with this, I think. Yeah. And so in space, you're floating in zero gravity. You're sort of like in a giant space womb. (laughs) Um, So you could say that perhaps, I I don't know, maybe the absence of or the absence of perceived gravitational force. I don't know. Maybe that does something. Maybe that's what the whole space genes thing is about. So could that. that, Okay. All right. Uh, That's fantastic. So could that also. Because we simulate on Earth, we simulate zero G by putting people in water. Do you think that li- maybe living underwater for long periods of time could also do the- have the same effect? You know, actually, if you're actually floating in water, not living in a like an installation where you're we're that's full of air, but actually, like say, wearing a suit and actually living underwater for long periods of time somehow. Yeah, I mean, potentially, if if that's the catalyst, the like the the change of gravity on the human body, um, because remember that all a lot of the ancient legends talk about these gods coming out of the oceans, Viracocha, uh, Oanes with the Greeks came out of the water and taught them and then went back to it every night. Yeah, I have something to be said for that um you know and then there's also the the study that was done you and i talked about this about when the atmosphere was much denser and um the increased energy available via um solar radiation causing uh megafauna yeah and just the fact that like the studies have shown that putting uh various animals under higher pressure increases their size because there's support Right. So, I mean, they're really, what can you say about that? That if you change the environment, like the barometric pressure, the, the gravitational force, the magnetic field, you change these things and there's a huge change in lifespan, size, um, yeah. you know, the way that something would move around, yeah. like walking up right versus on all fours i mean there's all kinds of variables that change completely so it's really difficult for anyone to say that it is impossible for humans to have longer lived life cycles well impossible in this specific set of environmental parameters maybe but who says that these are the only environmental parameters that we've ever existed in okay yeah Yeah. so Go ahead. Brenner, Brenner sent us a video. We, we've been having, like we said, this ongoing conversation. Um, he sent a video of a guy. It was a TED Talks. And I can't remember the guy's name, but he was doing an experiment. He was actually a, a music professor, and he started messing around with, you know, resonance. And he was he was talking about how, you know, this person can sing and break the wine glass and you can break things if you find their resonant frequency and then you crank up a tone generator loud enough at that frequency, you can shatter it. 
And so they ended up finding this uh, uh, patent on a basically a, a plasma antenna that allowed them to make these pulses of electromagnetic fields at whatever frequency they chose. And so they started looking at cancer cells and trying to find their frequency, their, their, oh, their yeah. resonant frequency. And so they're, they're pulsing this electromagnetic field at the cancer cells, you know, in a slide and they're watching them. Like when, once they find the right frequency, which was like, you know, a hundred thousand Hertz or some, somewhere up there, um, it, the cancer cell would just start breaking apart. apart, just completely disintegrating. And so they're, they're looking at this as like a, a you know, this a new kind of cancer therapy. Yeah. And it, it, all the other cells that are totally different sizes have totally different resonant frequencies would not shatter. They're just like swimming around doing their own thing or whatever. Yeah. And the cancer cells over there and just like, <laughs> just, just coming apart, turning into food. <laughs> so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because going back to the, the, you know, the Schumann resonance, uh, if there was a time when the electromagnetic field resonant frequency was optimal for, say, the telomeres not chattering and falling apart. Like, in other words, oh, yeah. they might be in a, a more conducive environment to grow longer. Maybe yeah. they would naturally grow no longer under different resonant frequencies, but because there are certain frequencies always happening now in this particular, I'm call, I call them... Solar regimes. Yeah. Solar regimes. Yeah. <laughs> I completely agree. So uh, this this one that we're in has limited man's lifespan to 120 years, yeah. as the ancient text said, after the flood. Like, so we have this massive cataclysm. And if it was if it was some type of solar cataclysm that that really changed a lot of things going on in the sun, a lot of things going on on Earth uh, and just totally limited our lifespan at that point it's it's conceivable in other words that that under different em frequencies and and amplitudes of frequency vibration that we might actually have you know longer lifespans because they they are not conducive to things like cancer and other other types of cells and more conducive to even smaller things like the telomeres or genetics uh, not yeah, falling apart. And definitely. Whatever. Um, especially when you consider that from a biochemistry standpoint, um, humanity as well as all living things are defined by the interactions of electrons forming chemical bonds and what's affected, like what oh, yeah. else do electrons do? They are the active units, quote unquote, of magnetism, electricity. Mm -hmm. So if there's a different resonant frequency if there's different radiations that we're exposed to then our electrons are in different states then everything changes yeah from the base level of biochemistry so, so you start there and then you build up to a fully functioning being and yeah i mean the possibilities are essentially endless yeah maybe the food of the gods whatever it was that they were eating was actually something that was designed like maybe it was some type of sort like electrical in nature, like maybe some type of electrolyte or electro yeah. something that caused their bodies to have a higher frequency raising their vibrations could you, or whatever. Could you, could I don't you, know. Could you eat something that would put telomerase in your body, Brett? Well, like, would that work? I mean, it, in theory, yes. The, the issues that I would see with that, and I'm sure there are ways to work this out, um, would be, you know, you'd have to have it buffered the right way so that it wasn't destroyed by your stomach acid. And then you'd have yeah. to have it in the right conformation so it could be absorbed in your intestines into a usable form. Um, so there, but I mean, if, if we're talking about the same beings that, you know, we give credence to the possibility that they could have genetically engineered us from the ground up. Yeah, they could totally do that. Shit. But I mean, can't yeah. you... Can like with some cancer treatments, like the the chemotherapy, can't you just like, don't they give them sometimes like an oral thing? They just take it and it's got like this. Yeah, they uh, use retroviruses. Is that what you're talking about? No, I was thinking of like what they put in your body that's radioactive. Oh, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it targets cancer cells, but it targets cancer cells in terms of like you have liver cancer. So we're giving you this corrosive radioactive shit that's going to be metabolized by your liver. Exactly. So it's going to go eating to it. your liver. Yeah. Um, so you can target things like that. Yeah. So the, ra- I mean, there's, the, the radiation there's all kinds or the radioactivity is doing the same thing. It's resonating at some ridiculously high frequency and it's just tearing shit apart. Yeah. So it's like, right. like it seems like there, there could be – now, I know that that in a lot of ancient texts, I think that the eating of things is, is a – Yeah, it's a big deal. Is a euphemism or is a, is a metaphor for, for oh, things, okay, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Like what's the Egyptian thing like the the something about – Opening the, of the mouth. Yeah, the opening of the mouth. Yeah. The, I don't know. Yeah, I there's know, a lot no of weird one, stuff. Yeah, about no one knows stuff. what the opening of the mouth ceremony was for, uh, or even what it looked like, but they know that it existed because they talk about it. So maybe it wasn't a quote unquote food necessarily that they ate, but it's like I don't know. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting too because um, so okay, so I've been what I've been thinking of, like you guys are going into the details of how it might work. But what I've been thinking of is the correlations to legends. Uh, think of like let's say that the quote unquote gods <clears throat> were just humans from the previous solar regime who had escaped the planet before the destruction happened because they knew it was coming, right? Then they come to return and like they can't they they realize that it's so different now that the lifespans are drastically changed and so they start trying to figure out well how can we well first now they're going to want to take supplements so that they don't die. Right? Exactly. Because yeah. they, and and they start living on they do things like live underwater uh because that that water blocks shitloads of radiation and it also may help stimulate your space genes, right? <laughs> Whatever. Uh so they're coming out of water and everything. And then maybe the whole deal like Sitchin talked about with the gold was not their attempt to heal their – well, it was their attempt to heal their planet. Just that their planet is the previous solar regime planet. They were wanting, they were wanting to make a golden shield around Earth because that could also – maybe they were thinking of this like seeding the atmosphere with gold mm-hmm. flecks in order to try to make it back like it was before. And then when they realized they couldn't do it, they left. Yeah. And here's another interesting thought. The um – the hyper quantum purple UV uh, <laughs> the su- absorbing paint. <laughs> yeah, the so super conducting the super quantum UV, super paint. <laughs> uh, yeah, UV. I believe it's UVA. I know there's UVA and UVB. Um, whichever one sunblock blocks. Um, Wait, you can block it, that thing. Well, so, it, go. <laughs> there's two types of UV radiation. One of them, the one that causes skin cancer. Like no matter what you do, it's bad for you. Yeah. Right. Well, that purple paint absorbs it. Yeah. So yeah. maybe things like that are also an effort to do something, you know, to try to make it possible to survive here. And I mean, that like, explains why purple has always been considered since king color, times, of royalty. The color of royalty. The kings because the gods. kings Dang wore it. armor painted in purple, super quantum, super, super conducting, super paint. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I wonder what plaid does. <laughs> <laughs> Plaid must do something seriously important <laughs> because of the makes you really good at chopping down trees. <laughs> it's like all like the you know the leprechauns and the guy with the little flute and stuff. It's like they're always wearing yeah. Plaid. And the, and there's the legends of the weird, the very tall guy with the gigantic eyes wearing plaid shirts, like all yeah. over history. And yeah, it must do something. Plaid does something. Makes you live forever. Plaid. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> Get your new Snake Bros plaid shirt. Yeah. <laughs> Live longer. <laughs> Even better, purple plaid. <laughs> you can be the most. The purple plaid of the gods. You can be the hippest hipster on the block. That's right. Purple plaid pants, purple plaid jacket. Come on, man. Nobody's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> And you might as well order your quantum superposition yoga mats. <laughs> Comes with two mats and a book on quantum superpositions. That's right. Yoga superpositions. <laughs> Strike a pose and occupy both mats at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> we got lots of commercials to work on here. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Quantum yoga. <laughs> order now and get your... Get two yoga mats so that you can occupy them at the same time. (laughs) All right. So the next topic I have, if I can pull it up here, Uh, if we're done with that, you guys done with that? Yeah. I mean, for now. Yeah. I'm going to be thinking about it for the next 10,000 years. (laughs) 
wearing your <laughs> super, super quantum plaid. purple plaid. Purple plaid. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we we went through Randall Carlson's whole thing on the Holy Grail, uh, which was fantastic. Now he has this he has this series of articles called the Redemption of the Beast, and this is like a, this is a big change of topic. This is about the carbon cycle. Uh, and it is fascinating and it's interesting because we have a job, Kyle and I work in where we try to grow things now, uh, or an orchard and a vineyard. And we have talked to many experts on growing things and all of them seem like nonplussed or like sort of, they kind of dismiss our thing about CO2 and plants needing it. And that's really all that they need. Uh, so Randall Carlson has CO2 and water, CO2, water and sunlight. Yeah. And a few tiny little bits. <laughs> yeah, micronutrients in the. But okay, so I'm gonna read this. I'll start out with this article. Maybe we'll. Maybe it'll be a two uh, show. I may have to not. I may not be able to finish all of the articles in this show, but because it's a six part series. Uh, but I'll skip some stuff. Anyway, he says I'll begin the review by introducing two graphs from relatively recent textbooks on environmental science that depict the, that depict the carbon cycle throughout the various planetary sources and sinks. Okay, so the importance of this is that it shows you the amount of CO2 in the air, the amount of CO2 in the soil, and the amount of CO2 dissolved in water, and so on and so forth. Uh, So he goes, you will note that the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is given as 750 gigatons. You will also note that that 560 gigatons are consumed in the process of photosynthesis by land plants. Okay. Wow. So that's most of it. Not much of a surplus there. Right. Take special note of the amount in the ocean, 38,000 gigatons, or 50 times the amount in the atmosphere. The soil at any time stores about 1,500 gigatons. In the ocean, the CO2 is taken up by a variety of marine organizations, organisms, (laughs) well, (laughs) that have the ability to precipitate calcium carbonate, or CaCO3, from seawater. This calcium carbonate forms the shells or exoskeletons of creatures such as scallops, uh, Bryzoans, Foraminifera, and another one that I can't even pronounce. Co- seashells. Co- co- yeah, seashells. When these creatures expire, their shells drift down and consolidate on the ocean floor, where they are eventually lithified under pressure into limestone, chalk, and marble to become part of the lithosphere or rocky crust of the earth. This is the greatest of all the reservoirs of carbon dioxide storage. This chart does not show the estimated amount of CO2 stored in the lithosphere, but it is enormous. Before going to the next graph, uh, note that the amount generated by through both human and natural combustion is six gigatons. That's both Itty human, bitty right? <laughs> That's both human and natural combustion, meaning all volcanoes, uh, all ocean vents, all that stuff. Okay, <laughs> tiny, tiny. The next graphic also depicts the generalized global carbon cycle. It is it is reproduced from... Okay, so he reads all that. Let's see. Or I won't read all that. It contains additional interesting details. The graphic In this graphic, fossil fuel burning accounts for 5.5 gigatons introduced in the atmosphere. This is one half gigaton less than the preceding chart, presumably the one half gigaton difference being the result of natural combustion and volcanism, which are not included in this number. <clears throat> okay. Storage in shallow ocean water is the same in both charts. Fossil fuel deposits are shown to contain about 4,000 gigatons of CO2, while the sedimentary rock reservoir contains upwards of 100 million gigatons. Yeah. Yeah. This is a truly staggering amount of carbon dioxide, and all of it at one time passed through the global atmosphere before it was taken up by the oceans, converted into biogenic carbon, uh, calcium carbonate, and locked into Earth's crust. Those dang clams are stealing all our CO2! <laughs> this is a clear implication that the ocean acts as a powerful pump constantly extracting CO2 from the atmosphere and ultimately sequestering it into carbonate uh, sedimentary rocks, where it remains for a very, very long, 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 long time. The natural process of ocean uptake is constantly depleting the Earth's atmosphere of carbon dioxide, and if not replenished, it would relatively quickly reduce the amount of CO2 uh, to a concentration too low for effective photosynthesis. Okay, so that's the first article. So, like, if you think about this, this is the other thing that always bugs me about the whole CO2 cycle. Like, the data almost always shows historical uh, temperature trends of the planet and, and, like, coinciding with CO2 in the atmosphere is that the temperature goes up first. And that makes sense. Think of a Coke. you got a carbonated drink. If it's cold, it's retaining its, it's, retaining its CO2, yeah. its carbonation. If you heat it up, it starts to bubble and all the CO2 comes out. The ocean is the same way. When it's cold, it can keep all the CO2. When it warms up, 
it starts to outgas CO2. Yeah. So the temperature rises and then the CO2 goes out into the atmosphere. They have right. used correlation the, is not causation. Right. They have used the uh, <clears throat> inexactness of of dating methods to say that it's the other way around. Yeah. Because there's always an error given. You know, usually yeah. of several hundred years or whatever, they could say, "Well, the CO two grows up, and then the the and then the te- pl- the planet yeah. heated." Uh, okay, so let me go to the next article here. But hang on, wait. No, I'm sorry. I, what? I had I was just working on this joke, <laughs> like based on this thing that he would, he said in the beginning. It was like, you want to tell somebody you're really going to kick their ass. You know, there's the thing where you're like, I'm gonna. I'm going to stomp a mud hole in you and walk it dry. Like that one. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like, I'm going to stomp you down until the lithification of your bones. <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> lithification. <laughs> I love that. That's right. <laughs> stomp you down into that mud until you get lithified. <laughs> <laughs> All right. After 21 year, more years of studies, uh, these authors, the late Sylvian Witwer, who passed away in 2012 at the age of 95, reiterated the fact that there were benefits to the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide. Am I starting at the beginning of the article here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But then he went on to say something else very interesting. He, along with co-author Emeritus Professor of Biology Boyd R. Strain, pondered the effect of increasing the supply of CO2 on the planetary vegetation realm and speculated that, quote, an increase in plant growth due to fertilization of extra CO2 has not been measured, but a 5 to 10% increase may have already occurred. Current data indicate that plants growing at higher than normal CO2 levels are more tolerant of water, temperature, light, and atmospheric pollutant stresses. There are effects on carbon metabolism, plant growth and development, micro- microbial activity, and terrestrial and aquatic plant communities. Here we see that by 1985, these scientists were speculating that there may have been that or may have already occurred as much as a five to ten percent increase in plant growth worldwide due to carbon dioxide fertilization. In other words, that that the CO2 levels have been steadily climbing yeah. for a long time. But at that time, they did not have sufficient data available to confidently make such a claim. We will come back to this question directly and see that now in 2017, which which is when he wrote this, we do have enough data to draw some conclusions. Returning to the subject of carbon dioxide utilization in greenhouses, we turn to a 1973 report by the Economic Research Service with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. In this report, titled Global Review of Greenhouse Food Production, the authors presented a brief exposition of early studies relating to the effects of controlled increases of carbon dioxide on plants. So here's a quote from their work. Carbon dioxide, along with water, is one of the two major ingredients in the process of photosynthesis. Below normal levels of CO2, often found in unventilated greenhouses, can reduce the rate of photosynthesis, while above normal levels can hasten photosynthetic activity. Okay. <clears throat> the expansion, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. The reason below normal levels of carbon dioxide occur in unventilated greenhouses is, is that the plants quickly consume all available CO2 as they grow. And unless the p- supply is replenished, it will diminish to levels insufficient for continued photosynthesis, thereby stunting further plant growth. The review goes on to discuss the upsurge in CO2 utilization in greenhouses in the 1960s due to the development of safe and economical combustion sources of CO2, along with monitoring devices and plastic tubing for distribution and circulation. These innovations led to a major increase of testing and experimentation. The review describes the situation in Europe at the time. The expansion first took place in Holland. It started in February 1961 when a grower used a, uh, used small paraffin uh, or kerosene oil warming stoves during the daytime hours on lettuce and obtained exceptional quality and weight. The effect was traced to CO2. Follow-up work at the Glasshouse Experimental Station in Naldwick showed outstanding results on lettuce and strawberries and good results on tomatoes, endive, spinach, and radishes. The weight of the lettuce was increased and growth accelerated by 20 to 30%. During the 1962-63 season, the area of treated lettuce expanded into thousands of acres and 25% of the early greenhouse tomato growers used CO2. By 1972, the total area treated in Holland was about 7,000 acres. Okay. <clears throat> so he says a 1968 or 1983 study on four plant species conducted using transparent open-topped chambers placed in fields. And like they could be open-topped cuz CO2 is generally heavier than yeah, it'll, yeah. it'll sit on the ground. So you don't have to have a ceiling if you don't want to. Carbon dioxide was fed into the chambers by means of a, a three-quarter horsepower fan and metered day and night. A high-pressure manifold allowed control of the ventilation ma- uh, airstream to generate three different CO2 concentrations. The tests were conducted by three botanists and report 
and a report describing the tests and their results appeared in the Journal of Science. The essential role of plants in the carbon cycle makes them a logical starting point for assessing the impact of elevated CO2 on living systems. Through photosynthesis, plants form the support system for the rest of the biosphere. Since carbon is a chief input in the food producing process, and he underlines this part, any appreciable response of plants to changing CO2 concentrations could have far reaching implications. The four species upon which the tests were conducted were corn, soybeans, uh, loblolly pine, and sweet gum trees. The plants were grown in pots and exposed to the different levels of CO2 for a period of three months. All plant treatment protocols, such as watering, fertilizing, light exposure, were controlled and kept consistent. The carbon dioxide concentrations vary between 340 and 910 ppm, parts per million. The results of the test was that, quote, growth was enhanced in all four species, yield increased for the two crop species, and wood volume increased for the trees. And in addition, Plants growing in atmospheres containing 520 to 910 parts per million CO2 did not undergo the wilting that we commonly observe for control plants on hot summer afternoons when the rate of water uptake was exceeded by the rate of water loss. This is negative vapor pressure. Wilting on hot afternoons inhibits leaf expansion and photosynthesis at a time when other environmental factors are most favorable for rapid carbon fixation. Thus, a corn plant growing in an atmosphere with a high level of CO2 was able to continue fixing carbon and avoided wilting even though it had a greater leaf area. Oh, yeah. And so, like, <clears throat> I'll, I'll stop there with the articles, but he basically ex- explains uh, he basically explains that the, the, the reason this happens is because the leaves, the plants, all grow extra shells and layers of cells on their leaves. Yeah. And they, they reduce the amount of stomata, which is the mouths that the plants open in the leaves to breathe in CO2. So they drastically reduce stomata amounts because they don't have to have so many of them to get the CO2 they need. And thus, and the, it's the open stomata where they lose the water. Right. So they become massively resistant to pathogens and water loss and all kinds of stuff. So we're going to take one more break. And we will come back for the final segment and finish redempting the beast, CO2, <laughs> and snakes. Snakes! Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Domans and pyramids and moai and obelisks and snakes. <laughs> Obelamps. <laughs> Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Final segment of the final hour. Episode 55. And we are talking about the beast. The beast. C-O- Double one. <laughs> <laughs> they call him the beast. It's a carbon cycle. You get on it and you pedal, <laughs> and it's made of carbon. <laughs> I heard those are really light, lightweight carbon <laughs> cycles. <laughs> All right, this is the third article in the uh, Randall Carlson's Redemption of the Beast. One more benefit: carbon dioxide and ozone. There is another benefit to carbon dioxide enrichment that needs to be discussed. It relates to the effects of ozone pollution on plants. Ozone, or O3, is a molecule composed of three oxygen atoms that normally makes up only about 0.6 parts per million of the atmosphere. The greatest concentrations of ozone are found in the stratosphere between 6 and 30 miles above the Earth's surface. Stratospheric concentrations of ozone range between between 2 and 8 parts per million, about 10 to 50 times greater than at the bottom of the atmosphere. At this height above the Earth's surface, ozone provides the crucially important service of intercepting ultraviolet rays, which are very damaging to living things. However, at low atmospheric levels near the Earth's surface, ozone can become highly phytotoxic. I think I said that right. Ozone can interfere with photosynthesis, and a considerable amount of evidence demonstrates the reduced crop yields when exposed to ozone pollution. The website of the Missouri Botanical Garden discusses the damaging effects to plant life from too much ozone exposure. Quote, Ozone is the most damaging of air pollutants to plants. The action of sunlight or ultraviolet radiation on molecular oxygen and oxides of nitrogen spontaneously generate ozone, and ozone can move across great distances to cause damage to plants far from its origin and therefore uh, therefore is classified as a non-point source pollutant. 
The uh, extent of damage depends on the concentration of ozone, the duration of exposure, and plant sensitivity. Acute damage to deciduous trees causes marginal leaf burn and dot-like irregular-shaped lesions or spots that may be tan, white, or dark brown. Symptoms may spread over entire leaves. Another common symptom is bleaching of the upper leaf surface. Acute damage to conifers causes browning at the same point on all needles in a bundle or needle cluster. Uh... Due to the known damaging effect of ozone on plants and knowing that atmospheric levels of CO2 are rising and would probably continue to rise and that many of the same industrial practices that added to the growing carbon pool also contributed ozone to the atmosphere, a number of scientists have looked at the interactive effects of carbon dioxide enrichment and high levels of ozone. In one important statistically rigorous study, the researchers sought to determine the interactive effect on plants in an environment both elevate, of both elevated carbon dioxide and ozone. To better understand this situation, the authors selected six perennial species, including two types of trees, quaking aspens and red oaks, two species of grass, uh, western wheatgrass and prairie june grass, and two species from the C4 group, or side, uh, side oats grama and little blue stem. The number and subscript refers to the type of photosynthetic pathway. C3 plants were discussed above. C4 plants have a different method of extracting carbon from the carbon dioxide molecule than C3 plants and are adapted to generally more arid environments. The idea in this study was to get a relatively diverse cross-section of plants and to perform, to perform the experiment conducted at the University of Wisconsin. 64 seedlings of each species were planted in two controlled environments, grow, uh, environment growth rooms. Each room was divided into four individual chambers for the purpose of testing the different treatment regimes. The authors described the situation. In industrial regions, current ambient levels of O3, or ozone, reduce photosynthesis in many and probably most plant species. Chronic O3 pollution commonly results in increased respiration rates, shifts in C allocation, decreased leaf retention, and shortened leaf longevity, and current levels are known to be high enough to reduce the growth and yield of agricultural crops and trees. After discussing their material and methods, (coughs) they report on the results of their experiments, and the results proved quite remarkable. The first thing they noted was that, quote, in all six species used in this experiment, plants grown at ambient CO2 were smaller and had a lower RGR, or relative growth rate, when exposed to an elevated level of O3-induced reductions in situ photosynthesis in ambient CO2. In other words, under a concentration of CO2 equal to present atmospheric concentrations, the presence of ozone caused stunted growth in the test plants. However, and this is where it gets interesting, Examination of the interactive effects of CO2 and O3 revealed that elevated CO2 re- uh, reduced the deleterious effects of high O3 in both photosynthetic and growth. Okay, so <clears throat> in other words, like ozone pollution that hurts plants is drastically reduced when there's more CO2. So these places, these factories that produce a lot of ozone, they also produce a lots of CO2, which... To, to use, you know, like environmentalist like uh, jargon, it offsets their CO2 footprint or the, it offsets their ozone footprint by creating yeah. CO2. But they're yeah. always wanting people to drastically reduce their CO2 footprint. You're like, well, wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wait. You hate plants? Why do you hate plants? <laughs> the, so that's article three. Let's see. Go to four. Uh, I thought that one had the greening. Maybe this one is the one that has it. Okay, part four. Tropical response to CO2. A study appeared in Trends in Ecology and Evolution in the year 2000 that looked at the response of tropical forests to increasing amounts of atmospheric carbon dioxide. The authors were with the Institute of Ecology and Resource Management, University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Their report, appearing in the uh, perspectives section of the journal, began by discussing what they presumed to be the inexorable future rise of atmospheric CO2 concentrations due to fossil fuel burning and land clearing, and the implications of this increase to global climate change. They then qualify their statements by saying, quote, however, these changes are meshed within an immense natural global carbon cycle that is still poorly understood and that will almost certainly prove, provide new surprises. Hmm. Well, they never say that part on the... <laughs> <laughs> The two things these authors emphasize should be kept in mind before continuing. The immensity of the natural carbon cycle relative to the contributions of humans and the fact that this immense natural phenomenon, which in the author's words is still poorly understood, is central to the question of climatic consequences. If the authors are right that the immense natural carbon cycle is still still poorly understood, how is it possible to be so absolutely certain of outcomes that we can declare the debate over and the science settled with respect to the matter of climate change? (laughs) Yeah. 
A recent review of experimental studies growing trees in open top chambers indicates that a 300 ppm increase in atmospheric CO2 concentration stimulates photosynthesis by 60%. Damn. That's just 300 ppm increase. Like, in other words, we go from whatever the 400 we have now to 700. Yeah. Uh, that's not even doubling it, so... Okay, so 60%. The growth of young trees by 73% and wood growth per unit leaf area by 27%. It seems probable that there will be a similar response in natural forest ecosystems. In the context of the notable findings of John Lloyd, uh, or the, the authors of the study, they proceeded to discuss the implications for the tropics. Quote, because of their intrinsic high productivity, tropical forests are a prime candidate for such a sea fertilization response, carbon fertilization, and the crucial question has been to what extent such a response might be limited by nutrient availability, right? That's yeah. what we have to deal with. In particular, by low nitrogen or low phosphorus. However, <clears throat> studies referenced by Lloyd have shown that plants might increase their nutrient acquisition process by investing in my mycorrhizal colonization and by mineralizing nutrient reserves in the soil by the product uh, production of surface enzyme systems and organic acid exudates. Badass. <laughs> so because they're they're getting more CO2 and they can do they're able to use more of their own natural their own resources to burn stuff out of the soil. Yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. In other words, if it it is entirely possible if not likely that plants in a carbon dioxide enriched environment will develop the means to more effectively utilize available nutrient supplies. Uh, mycorrhizae are actually two different entities, a plant and a fungus, existing in a symbiotic or mutually beneficial relationship. Various kinds of fungus associate themselves with a particular plant through the root system. It has been found that the mycelium of the fungus can perform a number of functions beneficial to the plant. For example, accessing sources of phosphorus unavailable to the plant alone. It has been found that plants in association with mycorrhizal fungus are more resistant to diseases and the effects of drought. These fungi are important in the colonization of barren or desolate landscapes that have been devastated by catastrophic floods, fires, or vol volcanic eruptions and provide greater protection for plants growing in soils with high metal or acid concentrations. They call attention to one of the important variables in the response of plants to rising CO2. If plants become more efficient in the process of nutrient uptake, it mitigates one of the limiting factors of plants' response to increased carbon dioxide concentrations. In many of the hundreds of studies conducted on plants' response to increased carbon dioxide, nutrient, avail nutrient availability, along with availability of light, was most frequently the limiting factor in the plant's exploitation of carbon dioxide-conferred advantages. If this turns out to be true, the plants, <clears throat> the plants gain improved means of accessing nutrients in the soil, thereby increasing their bulk mass available for carbon uptake. Then, as they point out, a small and steady increase in forest productivity can produce a large net carbon sink. In other words, the increase in biomass increases the, availab uh, the ability of the forest to consume more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and transforming it into greater plant mass. The incre increased growth in plant mass, the forest in turn consumes more carbon dioxide in a positive feedback loop, removing it from the atmosphere in the process. So that's, that's really cool. Like it's, it's like a, a balancing act. Really. Right, right. The plants are – the, the the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere, the bigger and better the plants get at breathing it out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Because they use it to get bigger and better. Right. <laughs> That's badass. <laughs> so like there's, get, there's all these things that we, you know, we do these soil samples and we'll send them off and they come back with all of this stuff in, from the chemists. Yeah. And the chemists will recommend, you know, adding all this. these micronutrients. Yeah. Adding this or that to your soil because... Ultimately, you know, whatever you're adding will help break down some some compounds into yeah. these various micronutrients that the plant needs. Yeah. But they never point out one of the main uh, chemical reactions going on, which actually results in more of the of the biomass in the soil biodegrading and creating CO2 because like <laughs> it, it'll reach certain levels of acidity or or whatever whatever its acidity level is yeah and it'll kind of neutralize and it and and the biomass will stop breaking down right so when you have bio biodegradation you you have released co2 right so it's like that's why we use composts you know you're putting all of this this plant matter and you're adding water and you're it's getting hot and it's going through all these chemical reactions right. and it isn't because the plant needs to eat that compost it's right because the compost decomposes and generates co2 That's in a right. cloud around the plant right now there's also the argument that it it's 
because it's decomposing and and it has like the whatever whatever the chemical situation is, it's easier for the plant to get you know the potassium or whatever. And right. Actually, I don't think that the plants even use that. The potassium does something else something in the else. soil that allows it to, to. But this also explains why talking to your plants makes them grow better. Oh yeah, because exhaling. If if you're a, if you're a fauna. It's as opposed to flora, when you exhale, you're exhaling CO2. So if you're sitting there like, oh, yeah, plants, you're going to be beautiful. You're breathing yeah. all over it. And yeah. it's just in like, the oh, sunlight. Yeah. Right. Make sure you're talking to your plants in the daytime. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or under a grill light or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As long as they have UV, they can take that CO2. They take six, six molecules of CO2 and sunlight and water, and they turn it into one glucose. And that UV is, is just a, a resonant frequency yeah. that, that is just right. Like there's the, the chlorophyll molecule or whatever it is inside the plant is like I the way I look at it is like it it starts resonating yeah due to that light and it's able in that resonant that frequency activates. to easily break apart the oxygen from the carbon right like which is not that easy to do but if you have the right frequency you can shatter it right <laughs> so like the chlorophyll molecule has a geometric design you know it's 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 got this specific geometry right. that that frequency of light hitting it vibrates it or excites it energetically, add, yeah. adding vibration to it. And so when it comes into contact with the CO2 molecule, it's the right frequency to just right. break that oxygen right off of it and get rid of that and take yeah. the carbon. Yeah. Like, that's the way I look at that kind of stuff. I think that's cool, man. Yeah. This is, what was the whole thing about, uh, <clears throat> well, chemistry is just applied physics, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got the like everything is waves people yeah Man, it's all vibration yep so now correlating this to ancient shit <laughs> corporates I mean no no <laughs> wait what what <laughs> yeah stone turds <laughs> that's right <laughs> lithification of I love looking for ancient shit I found some one time I showed it to a paleontologist he was like yep that's a corporate that's ancient shit right there <clears throat> Lithification uh, and defecation. But. What? <laughs> <laughs> Lithification of the defecation. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So, <clears throat> if previous to the end of the Ice Age or whatever, uh, you know, before the cataclysm that changed everything <clears throat> if we had a massively increased co2 amount then we would have had we were, and we were talking about this uh the watcher and i were talking about this in the break we would have had megaflora yeah okay and that explains megafauna like you can't really have megafauna without megaflora like you need like you know because these like uh, like a single mammoth needed like multiple tons of biomass to sustain to, to, to sustain itself every day yeah, you know, and it, like we go back to the dinosaurs, like you know the uh, the apatosaur or the alamosaur or whatever. These humongous, you know, just titanic, like leaf eating or like uh, uh, herbivores. They needed a lot more than mammoths do. <laughs> like you need yeah. megaflora to support megafauna, right? And like that, those I think those two things correlate because like I I believe that it. Uh, like a massively increased amount of CO2 in the atmosphere probably implies that we had a lot more atmosphere without some kind of artificial induction into it, right? So if we had, if we have a, a much heavier, thicker atmosphere or whatever, and the pressure is higher, then that ex that explains why things could grow so much larger. Mammals, anyway. Yeah. You know, because they've done those experiments where you put something under, if you put something under a pressure of two atmospheres... Like two, two, like twice the amount of pressure we have at sea level, it'll grow bigger. There's yeah. just more oxygen, you know. It's got it's, more of a structure around it, and it's easier it to get. It's easier to get the oxygen out of the atmosphere, and it's it's and that's the energy that it needs, or yeah. whatever. So yeah, it has more of a of a of a support structure around it, and it has the more it's it easier access to oxygen, which provides the energy for everything in any kind of animal. Yeah. Uh, so you have higher pressure, you have higher amount of CO2, you have enormous plants, and that's why you have enormous animals. And then something yeah. happens and destroys it, changes everything, changes the magnetic field, changes the, the atmosphere. We lose, like maybe we lost a bunch of it, like Mars has lost most of it. It's like, okay, we have this this little perfect little picture of this 
ancient world that no longer exists that had all these huge freaking things everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And yet the idea that something huge in terms of time is just utterly ridiculous. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. you live long oh, yeah, lives. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it could be enormous in size, but not in time. Uh, right. That's what I mean. It's yeah. like it's like we have that picture recorded. Yeah. You know, in in the rock. Right. Like we see all these massive animals and yeah, they probably live for thousands massive, of years. Who knows? I, I mean, I'm just saying it's like like the fact that that can happen, but it's just totally ridiculous to imagine there was some situation here where things could live long. Right. I, just, I don't and know. And people could be huge. Like if we had megafauna, we would have had mega hominids. Like why yeah. wouldn't we have enormous people? Where are the where are the giant gorillas, man? Because uh, we came from apes. Gigantopithecus so was ten feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> he did though. <laughs> he did. All of more than gigantic size. That's right. <laughs> They're in the uh, Smithsonian. Yeah. <laughs> 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 but I think that's fascinating that like all of this stuff correlates to this picture of the ancient world that's provided to us by the myths of the ancients, not the standard model of today. The standard model of today is like, eh, it's all, it's all bullshit. Like all those stories about giants or, you know, uh, people living alongside of enormous animals. Yeah. And saran wrapped dinosaurs. <laughs> I mean, that all goes back to uniformitarianism it's like that you they can't imagine you know that we could have lived in a world that was that different because it's right too long ago it's it doesn't fit evolution yeah like we don't yeah yeah and i i think that like uniformitarianism doesn't like the the idea of very like they they always point to adaptation as the evidence for evolution but i'm like adaptation happens very fast it's it like takes place very quickly or it doesn't happen at all. If you don't adapt, you die, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it happens quickly by nature. Uh, and so, like, the adaptation of humans to f- from the previous world to the new one was very quick, probably. But people who didn't adapt died. Yeah. And, and, or because they didn't, like, later on go study the part that they should have studied so that they wouldn't die when they were doing it at the time. Like, right? <laughs> yeah. You got to study your adaptation after you've done it. You got to figure out how to adapt later on. Right. So like. So that you'll retrocausally adapt. (laughs) (laughs) I'm thinking about like the flood, right? In in terms of adaptation. It's like you have to have one raindrop every couple of days in order for us to adapt to a worldwide flood. (laughs) 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 It's like, you know, in, in. 10 million years, we're we're all walking around in puddles. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yes, there was a worldwide flood over tens of millions of years. 50 million years later, (laughs) we're up to our necks in it. (laughs) (laughs) We're adapting, (laughs) I I think. Yeah. So so their necks grew a little bit longer (laughs) (laughs) over the next 10 million years. (laughs) Giraffes. (laughs) Giraffes, that's right. Giraffes survive the flood because necks. <laughs> <laughs> That's why our breathing areas are at the top of our bodies. That's right. Because there was water everywhere. We used to breathe through our feet. For the first four or five feet. <laughs> so we became six feet tall and our breathing apparatus was at the top. That's right. <laughs> That's right. And we developed these little hoods, our noses, so that whenever a wave came, you could keep your air and it wouldn't <laughs> splash into your head. <laughs> right. Those waves came really slow. That's right. It took them thousands of years to develop. <laughs> and then we learned how to swim. <laughs> or somebody got fat and floated. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Adaptation. Get fat. Float. <laughs> That's why we're all obsessed with salt. Because <laughs> it makes you float in the water. Yeah, right? yeah well, you add it to the water. Dang it, all this fresh water, I'm sinking. <laughs> yeah. I remember diving for – you remember diving for lobster in the Caymans? Yeah. In the bay, which was, like, incredibly salty. Yeah. And, like, you couldn't do it. <laughs> you try to dive under the water, it's like <laughs> – <laughs> It was so hard to stay down into the water. Yeah, and it was really cloudy, and I remember getting down into some trench. 
Yeah, and then you and see the, the lobsters all on the side. Yeah, yeah, and you're like, yeah, there's lobster, and then some big shadow is like, <laughs> by you, and you're like, oh my god, oh my god, I'm getting out of there. I don't think I want to dive here anymore. That's right. Now you know why all the lobsters are hiding in those holes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man. So I want to th- like pull back to a theme that we were talking about a couple of shows ago about the. Like the sort of concealment of this whole thing, like why, why, uh, like why are there specific things that get hidden, like the like the longhead skeletons or the giants? Uh, you know, they don't hide like the ancient cave paintings, unless they find one in a place where it doesn't fit the story, like Malta, right, where they erase the bull, the bison bull off the wall in the hypogeum. Yeah. Uh, so like when you look through this stuff, you see like, okay, so they're telling us things and they're telling us things, but there's very specific things like that, that get concealed or get hidden. Like the ring watch that they found in the unbroken tomb in China, you know, like they told us about that. Why? Why did they tell us about that? It's an out of place artifact and it's impossible to, to explain. I have no idea. I, I don't, I mean, there's like different groups of people doing different things so it's kind of hard to say like why one piece of information gets out i mean not necessarily that it was on purpose yeah you know like in china one of the things that they definitely hid or not hid but there was there was a sort of a multinational effort at digging up these areas where they had they started finding these mummies that were obviously very ancient in in china and they were having red hair blonde hair yeah braids and then one guy, one guy famously asked, like, can, can I take, can I get the fingerprints off of them? And the Chinese guy was like, can you tell their genetic ancestry by their fingerprints? And the guy was like, yes. And he was like, no, you can't take their fingerprints. Mm. Right. He doesn't, because China's story, its own internal story about their land is that they've <laughs> always been there. Right. Excuse that, me. That those people that they, you know, it's a, it's part of the totalitarianism of it is like they have this history that they have told all their people. And they can't allow that story to be upended by there being white people there thousands of years before they were supposed to be there. Yeah. So they can't allow this British scientist to get the fingerprints off of these red haired mummies because that would destroy their story. Yeah. So that that, make, that makes sense. You know. Yeah, it makes sense. But that, that goes back to the indigenous argument. Yes, exactly. But, but all that stuff does. That's, I mean, that's really, in my opinion, we've talked about this before, that that, that seems to me to be the best answer. Um, you know, yeah, that, that, that's, there's something political involved. Yeah, it's power. modern. I mean, yeah. the reason for hiding all of this is has to do with modern power structures. Yeah. Well, yeah, but like, okay, so... When they discover tombs that have not been looted, but then they f- don't find a body and they say that it was looted, what's happening there? Because the people who would normally are normally running the power structure did not do that. They, you know, they're they're breaking into the tomb for the first time. And they're telling people like, well, you know, they're all this treasure, but there's no corpse. Yeah, maybe they didn't do it. I don't know. Yeah, so you're saying that like maybe they they hid it or whatever. If it was a giant or a long head, like, yeah, what are they going to do with it? <laughs> Send it to the <laughs> Smithsonian. Yeah, publish it? No. <laughs> but people have published those stories. It's just interesting to me that, like, sometimes it looks like somebody else was hiding the body. Yeah. But I mean, like, all those stories, like, that, that Jim Vieira is collecting from... All the, you know, these major newspapers doing stories about giant skeletons being excavated yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Like, there was a time when there was no control over that. And then, you know, you yeah. start seeing these, these, this, this big uh, fight with science and religion and, yeah. you know, what's the right story? And then we have evolution and all that. And, like, all the quote unquote scientists latch onto that idea and it's like, oh yeah, yeah, this is the way it, it happened. Right. Uh to discredit, you know, all of these, you know, mainly I, I guess the Christian creation idea. 
Right, which you can also view as the older power structure, too. Like, it was an yeah. upending of an older power structure. Right, like, so they built this whole thing, and then these these other things that get in the way, especially things that point to the idea that these myths in these ancient, quote-unquote, religious texts are correct. Yeah. They've got to, no, the, the, you know, get rid of that. Yeah. But it's weird, too, because at the same time, they're standing on the shoulders of men like Newton, Copernicus. Uh, yeah. Standing on the shoulders of giants. Like, I always point this out. Like, previous to about 200 years ago, everyone was religious in some way or another. Yeah. So all of human development, from wherever you think it began to 200 years ago, we can, like, lay at the feet of people who believed in a god of some kind, religious people. So to yeah. turn around now and be like, oh, this stupid blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you start at the beginning? And then get all the way to where we are now and then tell me that. Like, in other words, like, you're standing here having, like, less than 200 years of development from people who are not religious. And all of their development is based on the work of all these other people who were. Yeah. You know, like, this the, this technological world that we have now did not, like, spring out of nothing starting from 200 years ago. Right. It stands on the shoulders of the giants, and the giants were religious people. Yeah. Thousands of years of them. Right. So, yeah, I'm like that was a, sort of a, an aside, but the point I'm, I guess I'm getting at here is that like I do seem I do feel like there is a deeper attempt at hiding history that is just helped along by the power structure deal and this sort of like uh, like it's it's I think the fight between religion and science is largely a, a, a kabuki theater. There are some people who really do think that way, but they're not usually scientists. You know, it's like what was the, the deal with you get a scientist drunk or whatever, and he'll tell you all the anomalies that he's seen, and they're crazy, right? And he, like, yeah. The, uh, and a lot of paleontologists, <clears throat> you know, like are the, uh, are not very strong believers in evolution, even though they will say that they are when they're publishing their papers. They follow the model. Yeah, but like this carbon cycle deal i mean like back in the 70s they're doing all these tests and now yeah you don't ever hear anything found. about that but right. all the major greenhouses in the world that are producing stuff are using massive co2 tanks and their right. gas and their shit right yeah but it's like don't publish anything about that right you know don't don't show the results of any studies with co2 right. like none of the journals will publish it if you try to write a paper on it yeah that's i mean that's totally it points to the political situation with with all that, you know. Right. It, I mean, and that's about power. Like, there's an attempt with the with the whole climate thing to like get everybody to hand over all of their power, like literal power, like actual energy. Yeah. Like to let hand us over all the, yeah. Let us regulate every possible way you can get energy. Right. Unless it's clean, <laughs> which we define. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And those are usually industries that we run or own. Yeah. So on that note, <laughs> that's the end of the show. <laughs> Stop giving powerful people your power. <laughs> uh, I think is the moral of that segment. <laughs> All right, folks, that was the end of 55. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I want to thank all the same people I usually thank, except that I want to add Brenner because he gave us this fantastic Sands of Time thing. Yeah. And a monitor. Thank you, Brenner, for uh, for contributing to this pyramid scheme by giving us toys for the Tangent Cube. Yeah. <laughs> well, he gave us this 30 second, or 30 second, 30 minute timer thing so that I actually know when the segments are ending now. It's awesome. And a big monitor so that we can, we no longer have to switch back and forth between the stuff that Brent is saying and the actual audio being recorded uh, but also thanks to Kyle for all the producing it's as always badass and keeps getting better thanks to Kyle and Ty for all the music and I, I probably made some of that music at some point or maybe I was like sitting next to Kyle when he's making it and I was like yeah bro that sounds badass <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Brett England the watcher for keeping us on the straight and narrow in terms of the truth thanks to Laura for all the intros they are awesome uh, I think that's about it Right? Yeah. I think everybody. Yeah. Thanks to Mr. Todd Mulville 
for donating to the pyramid scheme and giving us pie. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> a little slice of pie. Um, <laughs> PayPal took a little slice Take, of your pie. PayPal took a bit and bite out of the pie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's it. Good night, Adamu. Get some CO2. It's a magnet.